Yo. Can y'all hear this? Just want to make sure y'all y'all rolling with this. All right, everybody. What's up? What's up? Okay, so we are here in the house. This is our my, I guess, Google I/O live coverage here. And you know, before we start things off, um, just need some of your help because, as always, I'm kind of running this show on my own. So if if you guys and gals, I can see you in the chat here. We are gonna take live calls as well, but just let me know if the audio levels are all right. Sometimes um, I can see what I have here, but. I just want to make sure that you at home can hear me a okay, and if we're good with that, then we are good with that. Um, just some information, obviously, that you can see. Let's see here. Where is it? It's right here, right down here. Yeah, right down here. This is our hotline that you can call in. I'm going to take your live calls. We'll talk about Google stuff, what we expect to see, what you want to see, maybe where they need a, where they're ahead, where they need to catch up. And just we're here to talk about tech because we love it. So um, that's the line that you can call in. Let me just see. We have people calling already in. We have this like fun little call screener that's kind of um, robotic and may not understand 100% of what you say. But this show is all about you all. You can obviously hit me up there. Um, I don't have my Twitter handle up there, but it's just at Brian Tong. So if you want to hit me up on the tweet tweets and you want to put a comment there. But I think it's more fun when we just do this live and we just have a conversation so what i'm going to do to kind of kick things off and just take me a moment to get it started is i did a preview of what we can expect at google io 2019 it's happening over obviously in the bay area so i'm in southern california they're doing it over in their neck of the woods so um let me just get it started here we're going to pull up the video first just to kind of set a foundation and a ground level of where we're at so if you give me a moment i will pull that up and uh we will start with here we go. And all right, let's see what's up. What's up, everybody? Brian Tong here, and Google I.O. is just a few days away. So this is really going to be everything that we expect to see at Google I.O. 2019 if it hasn't been leaked already. So this keynote is always focused on the future of Google software from Android to the Google Assistant and their other apps and services. It's no secret, Google's Pixel 3a and larger Pixel 3a XL 
will be their new mid-range phones. And when I say it's no secret, hey, uh, we're already out in the open for display at a Best Buy in Ohio. Now, they start at $399 for the 3A's 5.6-inch screen and $479 for the XL's 6-inch screen. Camera quality is expected to be pretty much the same as the Pixel 3, but they're really working to lower the price by using a less powerful processor, changing from a glass build to plastic, and then getting rid of wireless charging as a whole, but bringing back the headphone jack because that is so mid-range. I mean, that should be in every phone still, if you ask me. Now, if we're talking phones at the top, we also have to talk about Android Q, and it's had a few beta releases, and some of the smaller features they've revealed is a system-level dark-ish mode that can help you save battery. You can quickly see your remaining battery life when you pull down the quick settings. There's more specific location access for apps, similar to what we've seen in iOS, and then more customization for the actual OS's theme, which is sweet. These aren't earth-shattering features, but you've got to expect that they're holding back for Google I.O. All right, other reports say Google is working on better gesture navigation on its Pixel phones. There could be signs of a Samsung DeX-like desktop mode when you plug your phone into a display, but Google has surprised us in the past, so I'm just looking forward to more surprises this year as well. I'm also curious to see what's going on with the Google Assistant. We know Amazon's Alexa platform. It may be more compatible with more devices, but Google still has the smartest AI out of anyone, and I want to see how it gets even smarter. It honestly can, and maybe even more powerful. Let's let's throw in Google Lens there, and let's try to integrate that more on a system level in Android OS, instead of it being its own little feature in an app on the side that you have to hunt for to use. So Assistant, Lens, amp that up. And what about the next generation of Google's creepy, but super cool calling assistant duplex that was really the highlight of last year now this time i want to see more like an actual live demo not some pre-recorded thing like a real time live demo or you know maybe they've got even bigger tricks up their sleeve i also you know for this past year i thought the google home hub was a clean and thoughtful product last year i like the fact that it didn't have a camera for what it was and it doesn't mean it was a gangbuster seller but i thought it was a good experience well now google itself is responsible for leaking a new hub on their own website uh, might be called the Nest Hub Max that will have a 10-inch HD display, a built-in camera, and stereo speakers. It sounds like they're a full-size competitor to the current 10-inch Echo Show, but it also could differentiate itself by having a Nest security camera in the actual hub because if you do that, now you've got my attention, and it would really set it apart from anything else that's out there. So we'll see if it's a real product with new improvements to the Google Assistant likely coming to the Home Hub and then blending this with the Nest. So this Nest Home Hub, it could be really interesting. Now Wear OS might see a quick acknowledgement, but they just announced before this keynote that it will be getting a new feature for glanceable widgets that you can swipe between one another called tiles. I think the biggest issue here is Google actually needs a flagship watch to showcase their software on it. You know, they figured it out that they need to make their own hardware and software for the phone I need to do it for the watch because there has been nothing compelling enough for me to even consider for a split second an Android watch at all. You know, the phones, you're like, man, Google Android looks really good. But for the watch, it hasn't even been a thought in my mind. Now, there's also Google Stadia out there. It's their streaming gaming platform that's still expected to arrive this year. They talked about it earlier at GDC. It's promising a lot of lofty things with 4K, 60 frames per second, HDR gaming with a high quality internet connection but maybe we'll get more details about it with e3 coming around though coming right around the corner maybe we won't so that's kind of like all the things that are on my mind and that's really going to do it for this video just some of the big tent pole features software and a little bit of hardware that we expect to see at this event now just in case you want to know i'll be holding my own live stream of the google io kino right here on my youtube page Tuesday, May the 7th. I'll be starting at 9.30 a.m. Pacific time, 12.30 p.m. Eastern. The keynote starts at 10 a.m. Pacific, and I'll be taking your live calls and comments, and we'll just watch along together and talk all about it afterwards because I know how many of you love that, and we will both have many. Okay, we don't, we don't need to hear me talk about the live show that you should be watching because we're actually doing it live right now. Or duh. So um, what we're going to do here is thank you so much. I know like sometimes it's crazy because I'm juggling like 10 things, but it, it just keep on letting me know if the audio is okay. I brought it down. I brought it up. It's a little hot. The other thing that I wanted to talk to you guys about is just kind of, I guess we call it some like orders of business 
is there are ways because I'm if you haven't noticed or haven't followed me, yes, this is like my, my new home, this is my new destination. And so I am completely 100% independent. So if you can, and if you'd like to, there's kind of a couple ways that you all can kind of be a part of the show and help support it. Obviously, patreon.com slash Brian Tong is one way. It starts at $2 a month. So what I have is obviously I do my videos on my YouTube page. I have an audio podcast called the Apple Bits XL. I kind of have special guests as well. And I do just basically tech, geek, and culture content. In addition to that, if you want to be a part of it, we also have here our little fun little super chat over on the side here. So if you feel like contributing, that's great. If you don't, tell your friends. Just be a part of the show. But I just want to say, again, I'm really grateful for all of you for just sticking with this and sticking with me and kind of really allowing me to still do this and uh, just do stuff that I really love. So holla, fat emo kid. I see you. I will do shout outs. I mean, it's kind of like far on this side, but um, I can see you all. So let me just do this and let's, you know, we talk about calls and how important those calls are. So we do have a call waiting for us. Let's get to our caller calling in from the 404. Um, let's just make sure we can hear you okay. Hi there, this is Brian. What's up? Welcome. Hey, hey, uh, Brian and Shamar. How's it going, man? Oh, yeah, Shamar, getting it in. <laughs> All right. Shamar, like Shamel, like classic, always trying to be the numero uno caller. I saw the 404. I'm like, oh, yeah, it probably is him. That makes sense. So what's up, man? Thanks for calling in. And what do you want to talk about today? Uh, actually, um, I was hoping that maybe – the the uh, about the Google Google Assistant the new one mm -hmm. um, that they're supposed to be showcasing. Now I'm actually waiting for JBL. Uh, they had uh, announced something last year, the uh, Link Bar. And I don't know if you've heard anything else about it because it was supposed to be this all in one. It was supposed to be a streamer as well as have uh, these um, different HDMI ports that you could like switch between like your TV the uh, your game uh, game console, and it's been kind of pushed back, pushed back. So I was just wondering if you maybe have heard anything or uh, if that's maybe what we're going to see today. I wasn't sure. So yeah, you know what? I don't. I don't think I am. I'm not. I haven't heard. Honestly, I haven't even been on point with that JBL uh, specific product. Just because. Also, I think. So honestly, no. I a first of all, I don't think we're going to see anything about it because. Really, the focus is they they deal with more than anything. Not only is their software, we know this, but like their first party hardware. If we see any hardware from them at all, it's going to be maybe this mid range Pixel 3a phone. Pretty much, it's going to be there. I mean, it's already on Best Buy shelves in Ohio, so I just don't expect us to see anything from a third party standpoint for for them to say, "Hey, we're rolling out all these other products." I think if they want to talk about the Google Assistant, they're going to more specifically talk about it on their own hardware because I think that the biggest issue or maybe perception um, thing that Google has is that people don't think that their hardware is good enough. I think the Pixel 3 hardware is more than good enough. Fine, talk about the notch all you want. 90% of the phones have a notch, right? I mean, it's it's to the point where I'm not even gonna complain about it anymore because it's just like old news, but yeah, it is, a, it is gross. So I think that they really wanna showcase their own hardware instead of showcase other people's hardware, especially when they're trying to do this whole software and hardware uh, merging together. And really their only best example of that where they control the experience is the Pixel 3 phone right now. Okay. So awesome I'm not stuff. trying to shoot uh, it down, any... but you know, I don't I just don't I just don't expect just based on how they rolled that we would see anything like that. Okay. No, I I mean that's fine and Lord knows, I mean sometimes we go on to these events expecting these big, you know, big product drops and big software drops and sometimes we get eh, a little disappointed as far as that area when we put too many expectations on on, yeah. on the christmas yeah. list as far as what, what we want to see so so but yeah but um i had also heard that potentially it might be uh, maybe not along the lines of that sound bar but their own like this an upgrade to their google assistant itself like this something with some amplified speakers or something some along that line as far as their own so something to kind of piggyback off of the max. Yeah, yeah. So I think I think with the uh, you know with the max, I think the product itself is actually really good. It, it sounds good. It, it's all we're getting to the point where now everything that we're talking about is hardware. Hardware in general is kind of peaking, and it's all about the software. It's kind of really been that way 
arguably the past two or three years more than anything else where yeah. phone sales and hardware sales have completely, you know, decelerated, <laughs> deaccelerated, <laughs> decelerated. And so yeah. I think from that degree, even though I actually enjoy these developer conferences because we get to see a lot of cool stuff and that's really what's going to drive this. I think I'm not saying hardware is getting boring, but I'm kind of saying hardware is getting boring. And so um, <laughs> until that next thing comes out, whether it's glasses or whatever, if they can really, someone can crack the nut with AR in our phones or whatever that next thing is. I think really we should look towards like the software to kind of get excited about. And, you know, we'll see what they do with Android Q. The beta didn't show us too much, but I've got to imagine they're holding back to show some good stuff. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, they got to try to keep some stuff under wraps. I mean, it's like whenever they rumor they drop a phone, all of a sudden it's already leaked on somebody's website. Now it's so hard to keep this stuff under wraps in this uh, 24 by seven news cycle. Somebody has, snuck a picture and put something on somebody's website so. exactly so exactly. <laughs> it's always a leak somewhere so it's kind of hard to get surprised but eh, we can fake it till until they <laughs> actually remastered it if they ever do yeah so. absolutely so you got you got anything else you want to talk about bro uh not really i mean that was pretty much the 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 main the the main thing as far as what i was long lines had questions about um that may be the duo. I don't know if they're going to do anything extra with that um, um, as well as far as if we were going to see a little bit more from, from the AI as mm -hmm. far as how um, – what was I going to say? As far as how, how much smarter it's gotten. Um, and we, I'm still waiting on John Legend supposedly to be the voice of Google <laughs> Assistant. That, is, that never happened. Well, you know, but with Google again, sometimes these things are not to say vaporware, but they sometimes uh, it, it can be something that's mentioned and then oh yeah about that, <laughs> or they just never speak on it and go to something else. So, so I didn't know if they were doing any, anything specific with that. So, um, let me see. Other than that, I really didn't not too much. I was just kind of been on wait and see mode, like with everybody else, just to see what they talk about and you know hopefully they can wow us. Yeah, I think I think the biggest thing for me is that I, I the product that I actually probably liked the most from last year's uh, I guess it's their fall October event was the Google Hub. I I kind of like the fact that it didn't have a camera. I like everything that it did. The Google Assistant is still to me the smartest. Now we know that the Amazon Echo platform has the most compatibility with smart home devices. It is more than smart enough, but the Google Assistant, quite honestly, is the smartest of them all. Yeah, it it's second place in market share, and Amazon is still dominating, but. You know, there's been rumblings about this whole potential new Google Home Hub with um, a Nest Cam built in it. Uh, you know, the net, the the Nest Hub, or kind of like their next generation that would have this potential um, like camera built-in security camera in the hub. I think that's interesting the, because I originally liked the hub specifically because there was no camera in it. But I think when you see what Facebook has done with the portal. Although I think the portal is actually really cool, but at the same time, there's no way in hell that I'm going to buy a Facebook portal because it's a Facebook portal, right? I mean, we already know. I don't know anyone that trusts Facebook in any way, shape, or form to buy a camera to put in their home. You know, there's a few, but not yeah, too many. I, I, thought, I thought it was I thought it was cool because a friend of mine bought one, and he he has like a, a elderly mother that he's taken care of, and the portal in this specific use case it follows him around and everything yeah. so it yeah. just it gives that that now as far as you know connecting with family though that, that's where these products tend to shine yep and unfortunately yeah the google hub doesn't have that i have i have two because i've kind of bought into the smart home ecosystem as far as google home is concerned so uh it, it, it's great i mean especially now that i have uh, youtube tv and everything being able to give the command and cast live tv to whatever room you're in in the house is it and a cheap little display, so I mean, it it, it actually works great. So I I I, just, I love the aesthetic; it's not too big, you know. It's just something just to uh, have play music around the house and everything. It it, it you know, it, it, in contrast to a competitor with a uh, Amazon and Alexa, it it works great. I, it, but the camera, yeah, that would probably be definitely a much added bonus, and you know, with Nest Cam just adding to that ecosystem. So, oh my gosh, that would be a good good little addition if they do that. So, uh. I got I got a cheap laugh for the uh, audience because I was switching cameras and I didn't realize which one was hot and um, I was adjusting my hair for like three seconds. 
And that's that's ah. what that's what we call a bad apple. Behind the scenes bloopers. Yeah, behind the scenes. <laughs> All right, hey, uh, Shamar. That, that, that'll make you boop it. Yeah, man, that's uh, that's horrible. Uh, Shamar, hey, thanks so much for calling in. Uh, we'll, we'll see what happens at the end of the keynote. The phone lines are up. We got like three or four people waiting, so I'm going to jump on them. But thanks so much for calling. Uh, go, ahead, it go, all, ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, All right, excellent, excellent. Not a problem. Have a good one, man. All right, take it easy. All right, bye-bye. Okay, we're going to go over to our friend here in the 917. I believe if the call software said correctly, your name is Joey. Joey, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. How you What's doing? What's up? What's up? Thank you so much for calling and hanging out. Uh, you know, we're here to do the Google I.O. live event and see what's shaking and what they're doing. What did you want to talk about today? Well, first, let me just tell you that I actually met you in Brooklyn at the Samsung Note 9 keynote. And let me just tell you right now in your audience, you are probably the nicest guy I've ever met. <laughs> and you are <laughs> a very chill. You're very chill. And uh, you do agree with this new show. And I'm glad, you, you know, the show is taking off. Man. I subscribe to you, and you're very on point with all your stuff. So let me just first, first tell you, you know, people that are listening, this guy knows what he's talking about. All right? Joey. That's first of all. Second wow. of all. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, thank <laughs> you. I really, I really appreciate that because, you know, I'm building up. I've been doing it now basically independently for a year. So I just want to say, man, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, that means a lot. So awesome. Thanks, Joey. Okay, let's, let's talk, let's talk about that tech, baby. All right. I want to know why – does it take everyone to like software integration as far as like, if I get a text message on my Google phone, why don't they have something like on a Google lap, a laptop or a Chromebook or even a tablet? Like Apple did it perfect. Apple with the iMessage nailed it. I can leave my phone in the other room and be talking on my iPad in my kitchen. It's just convenience. I don't know why nobody has uh, caught on to that yet. Not even Samsung yet really. And uh, that Tab S5, whatever does it, but their older generation tablets don't do it. So I'm hoping maybe Google today will you know, reveal something in regards to some kind of software where you, know, you get a text message on your phone. Maybe if you're logged into your Google account on, say, I don't know, Chrome on your, in your browser, you could answer or reply back. I mean, that to me, I think is a big convenience. You know? No, Joey, I think, I think you've hit it right on the nose. There's a couple things that I really want to see here um, from Google I.O. specifically. I'm hoping that one of the things they do is really amp up their message app because they've tried to do a lot of bells and whistles, but ultimately, and whether people like the comparison or not, people want that kind of iMessage ecosystem syncing across all their devices instead of it just kind of being done on the carrier side where, you know, the messages app, you want that just like sync synchronized messages everywhere. I, I really hope that they do that and just amp up, their compatibility in building their own ecosystem. I think you're, you've are you hit that one right on the head. The other thing that I wish that they really did and is still one of those things that we don't know if they're going to do it is a while ago, I think maybe a couple years ago, they came out with this app called, um, I believe it was Files Go. And it was, you know, you still had to download an app, but it was a way to transfer files over from, you know, one device to another, a la, I, don't, I wouldn't say it was equivalent to Apple's AirDrop, but it's kind of like that. If they could nail the messaging and literally the airdrop to give themselves an airdrop type functionality, which we've heard rumblings that they've continued to be working on. That is where you start getting to the point where people really be like, okay, I still have those two ecosystem hooks that are so strong with me with Apple that I could go over to Google because, or Android, because I went to a recent concert. I brought an Android phone, a Samsung galaxy S 10, I took all the photos and videos. I just wanted to really like go to a concert with and just be like, hey, you know what? I'm not going to use my iPhone. Uh, I'm going to use this to take photos and videos. Yeah, it was BTS and people can judge, but BTS is dope. But what happened is like when I came home, I, you know, there's this app that you can do like Android file transfer to an Apple uh, computer. It couldn't detect my device for whatever reason. Instead, I had to go and, you know, put Dropbox on my phone, upload the photos and movies from my phone to Dropbox and then get it from my computer and do whatever. And that's just literally two or three steps that aren't just a quick step. They're long steps. And I really, really, really want Apple's, I'm sorry, Google specifically to give us the best thing that they can do. That's equivalent to airdrop. Cause I think that would make it a whole lot easier to change over the ecosystem. And if it means we have, to, I agree, you know, I, I agree I with think you. That's a huge, a huge miss. I think Google has the potential, or anyone for that matter, even Samsung, to 
to, I mean, I'm not saying copy Apple, but let's just yeah. face facts. I mean, I, I had the very first iPhone. I loved Apple. And lately, they haven't been really doing anything that I've been wanting to get the new iPhone. And the only thing that keeps me on the Apple devices is the iMessage and the usability of, like, AirDrop and stuff like you just mentioned. And uh, at Google, they, they had the potential to the software to do all this. I just don't understand why they don't, they don't do it. Is it a trademark issue? Is Apple, are they gonna afraid Apple's going to sue them? I don't know. And between me and you, and this is my honest opinion, I think Tim Cook needs to go bye-bye. <laughs> yeah. He's not doing anything good for the company. I'm sorry. Uh, Steve, Steve Jobs was the, you know, all innovation left with him. And AirPods, an extra whatever it is for a charging case, which is ridiculous, by the way. But uh, going back to the Google thing, I just wish Google or anyone for that matter will have you know, the guts to actually do something like that and go along with it. I'm telling you, they would make a huge difference in the, in the mobile market for sure. Yeah, I think but one of the issues so. is also basically it has to happen on the carrier side. I don't know if you've heard some of the nightmares of people basically switching over from Android to I, to Apple, Apple and back, and their message is not syncing properly because of how the carrier handles it. That's one of the issues that it has. But look, I, it's been at least they know we know that everyone copies each other, so that's not that's not a surprise or anything like that. So it's just up cars to do it. Car right manufacturers now. do it. Car, we, we, we everyone does thing, it. Right? Car manufacturers. I I had a Honda that looks like a BMW. Like it's, <laughs> it's everyone does it. I mean, everyone has great ideas. It's so what if you steal a little bit? You just can't take. You can't steal everything. Exactly. You know, it's, exactly. And like, so, like you know, the notch. Well, everyone was okay with the notch. Apple started the notch genera- uh, revolution for better or worse. But you know, there is now these days, like we I kind of talked about earlier, hardware is kind of plateauing. Everyone is kind of doing really the same things. It's all about the software and where Google needs to catch up specifically with Android is with their software hooks. So let's see if they give us a semblance of anything that just gives that one click. You know, let's just even start basic and go Android to Android, right? Let's not think about other platforms. Let's just kind of keep it Android to Android device and see if they can get there. Man, even just I agree. Google, pure Google Android. Let's get start at baby step one. And then, um, and then see where it takes us. So, um, Joey, is there anything else that you're kind of specifically looking or hoping to see here at the keynote? Thanks so much for calling in. You're awesome, bro. Uh, night, uh, Brian. Thank you. No, uh, that's it actually. And um, I just want to say thank you for taking the time to talk to me. And for your listeners out there, I'm telling you, this guy's a good dude. He knows his <laughs> stuff, and I really support your channel. And I always subscribe to you. And every time you send, drop a new video, I get that email. Man. So keep up the good work. And uh, I'll be I'll be watching the keynote at my desk. I'm at work, so awesome. I'll uh, you know listen. I'll, I want to give chances to the other callers who are waiting to probably speak to you. So listen, enjoy your day. Uh, it was good speaking to you. It's always a pleasure, and keep up the good work, Brian. All right. Awesome, appreciate it, Joey. Thank you so much. All right, what I what I was doing while um I was talking to Joey is even though yeah you'd see my face and it was delayed, I kind of like to show love to our chat, and there are people that are you know showing love and doing some of like the super chat for me. So Alan Robertson. Thank you so much for, you know, chiming in. Kevin Garcia is talking about how he first discovered us on BOL. So uh, I just want to say again, thank you to all of you that continue to kind of ride with me. And, you know, this this is all fun. We all just love this stuff. It's tech. Like, there's no sad stories in tech. And it's just really exciting to be able to talk about this stuff. And this is the stuff that changes our lives. So thank you to everyone who is just, like, here and contributing. So, again, just to let you know, the keynote is expected to start at 10 a.m. Pacific time. So what? We're about, geez, 10 minutes out from that. Um, at that time, we'll go to the live stream. I'll dip in and out. Typically, Google's live stream is about an hour or so, um, and we'll see what else happens after that. We'll come back after the show, do more calls, and kind of do a wrap up. But uh, let's go to more calls here. It looks like I'm. Gonna, I hope I got your name right, or the call screener did. We're gonna go to Dion. Is that correct? From the 980. What's up, Dion? Hey, what's up? Is it? Did it, Did they get your name right on the call screener? Yeah, they did this time. <laughs> the last two times they didn't. <laughs> well, I'm glad. I'm glad they took care of you this time, bro. Yeah, man. Um, first things first. Uh, I was just listening to the last caller. Yes. Um, Google Google actually does have that same. Well, they had it with the message continuity thing in Hangouts, where you could have gone on the web or any one of your computers and get the same message. But we all know Hangouts is dead now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. 
But also, you, I, heard, I heard you were saying that you went to a concert, you took some pictures, and you wish you could have get it on your computer. Do you know you could sign into your Google account and go into Google Photos that all your stuff is there? Well, yeah, what I'm saying is I know that, but it's more um, the I don't even – to me, that that's fine, yes. I totally know you can totally do that, but I just want it to be able to, like, when I'm in the moment at the show, be able to, like um, – like send it to a friend or immediately transfer, you know, just, just a one quick hit. Not even, that's what I mean. Like oh, kind of those I, in I, the moments. I, I, in the I moment. I could actually do that. You got, you, you could actually do that. You could set up like me and my wife. Like I send any pictures I take of myself or anybody or anything. I could automatically, it, it automatically sends it to my wife. So we have our, our Google accounts linked. Well, I mean, that's your wife, right? But I, let's say, you know, like when you're going to like a party and you have like, let's say, have you ever gone to like, I don't know, you've gone out with like six or seven friends, you're eating dinner and you just all want to like trade photos really quickly. Like it's one of those things mm -hmm. where because 90% of people have iPhones, they're like, oh, airdrop this to you, airdrop that to you, airdrop that. It, it happens all the time oh, wow, on family wow. vacation events. And so yeah. I just want Google to give us something like that, even if it's just for the Android community and the Android side to start off. That's all. That's all I'm hoping to see because it is really one of those things that are. I know there's always ways to do it, but it's literally like instantaneous. And when we get to that point, that's once you once you have that and you yeah. go to another platform, you don't. You just really miss it. So. Yeah, but you see the the thing about it is uh, that person would have to have Google Photos because they have a way to instantly share it in Google Photos. Yes. So hold on, one second. If, people, you, are, if you... people are saying the call, my calls are clipping. So. Give me a second, buddy. Um, I'm just, I'm just going to uh, make sure that everything here is rolling all right. Yeah, keep, keep going, keep going. You can keep talking. Okay. Yeah, and 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 to share files, you could do that through Google Drive. Like I share files all the time to any one of my friends. I just tell them, hey, send me a um, Gmail account, and I automatically just send files to them. So Google, I think Google needs to just do a better job like Apple does of making people aware of features that they do have more than more than just putting it out there and letting the tech community try to try to make people aware of it. No, no, I, I I'm totally there with you. So hey Dion, thanks so much for calling, all right? Okay, cool. All right. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. Appreciate it, bro. Okay. Yeah man. Okay, this is a okay. So sorry, guys. I'm trying to like play with the audio levels. This is a funny. I have to address this question because you know we got this is this is where you got like why y'all even here. So why H H here is saying, hey, do you regret leaving the unknown place that will not be said because your channel's not doing as good as you expected? My channel, honestly, I've been I'm super surprised and thankful. Like, if you look at my channel. Subwise, what I'm at like 137k in a year, and if you look at my video views compared to that other place, well, that's all you need to know if I'm really having a problem or not. No, we're good. We good. Just keep on doing what I love and let the rest take care of itself. Um, and I'm I'm loving it. Like this has been kind of a a journey for me, and for those of you who follow along, I'm just so grateful for that. So uh, yeah, I we we good. We good. <laughs> all right. Um. Sorry about the calls, guys. I'm going to try and keep on working to balance this out. It, it's kind of uh, a little tricky on my system, but here we go. Let's go take uh, the 646. It looks like Michael might be calling in. Michael, can you hear me? Are you there? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me good? Excellent. Yes. Uh, if the chat room tells us that I need to lower your volume, I will, but just keep talking shop, baby. Like You don't got to worry about anything. Uh, all right. Well, before I start, uh, I just want to say real fast that um. I am actually a YouTuber myself. I have my own channel, but I don't want to, you know, promote myself. I just want to say right off the bat, you are an amazing guy. And, oh, like, you're actually the reason that I do YouTube in the first place. <laughs> I was always kind of shy and kind of, you know, always a very introvert person. I never really liked to be sociable. And when I watch your videos and I watch how you talk and you present yourself, you kind of giving me a little more kind of, I guess, I guess you could say more freedom and a little more security because i feel more safer to be open and be public and about my opinions and states on what i think of android apple samsung ios android so i just want to say thank you for being wow. kind of an inspiration helping me as a youtuber you know i'm like honestly i'm like one of those guys that's totally like up in my feelings because i like i feel you when i say that like when you say that so thank you so much i think that that's amazing that i could help kind of you that just by doing what i love that you can pull like points of inspiration and i think that the best thing you know, my advice to you is 
just keep doing what you love. Honestly, if you what I what like this whole video and content has been around since the beginning of time. Internet video is so different because it allows you to have this direct connection with an audience and truly be yourself. So you know what? Be yourself. You do you, and there will be an audience that finds it. And make sure you know the content that you put out is something that you would want to watch. And I think if that's the case, then you'll be okay. So I just encourage you to keep on going and continue to just kind of you know stay inspired and just do the stuff that you love because I can only speak from my own experience. You know, you work for a big company and, you know, I wanted to make sure I had the skill set that if I ever wanted to go out on my own that I could do it. And so everyone who does the whole YouTube creator life understands the hustle and even just kind of the mental toll that it takes, but it's still something we love to do. So whatever that you're doing it on YouTube or if you're watching at home right now, I just encourage you guys and gals to just be passionate what you do and just, you know, go 100 and, you know, if it works out, it doesn't. If it doesn't, like you're going to find the next thing that makes you happy. And that's all that really matters. And I, I again, I can only speak for myself. So, Michael, uh, you know, thank you for those comments, but I want to encourage you as well, man. Thank you. And I really, really appreciate it. Uh, but what I'm looking forward to the Google because I don't want to keep on track because I don't want to take up too much time because they're on all the callers. So, I'm just going to get right to it. I'm kind of looking forward to Google just kind of being its own because for last year, for me anyway, I've noticed a lot of Android smartphone makers have been using. Android and their platforms of making their hardware kind of similar to iPhones. And for me, I was always a little annoyed at that because like they're so much better than that. And I'm not just speaking ill of Apple. I'm speaking as a whole because Android is very customizable. It's open end and you could do so much more with Android. And it always gets annoying because when I see smartphone designs taking the notch, like you say, Apple started the notch trend. They weren't the first ones to do it, but they were the mm -hmm. biggest player in the game to do it. So I feel like this is the year that Google and Android phone makers are finally starting to wake up and be like, we don't need to be iPhones. We can do our own thing. And what I'm looking forward to this event is obviously their software, how they're able to make their own ecosystem with, you know, some few ties and with Nest. With Nest, acquiring Nest on its own is a big corporation. That's security. That's the number one thing that people always go for. And owning Nest gives them an edge because that's premium security right there for house and even personal life. So, I'm looking forward to seeing what Google brings to the table of just being their own. I know the 3XL was a pretty ugly phone, I won't lie. It is a very good phone, but a very bad-looking design. But for me, I'm just looking forward to seeing what Google could bring to the table and help incorporate with other Android smartphone makers. Because you look at Samsung, yeah, they took things from Huawei, but ultimately they didn't follow in the route of Apple or other companies. Of course, they took this concept of the reverse wireless charging from Huawei, but they took the punch hole design try to elevate it to their version, and right now it's doing well. And I look at the Pixel 3, the standard Pixel 3, and I think that's a great phone on its own. And it can be elevated to 10 times more. So I think that Android has finally woken up and said, look, we are not iPhones. We're not going to be iPhones. We are what we want to be, and that's Android. So I'm looking forward to kind of see what they do. I could care less about hardware, hmm. because ultimately hardware means nothing if your software isn't in tune with it. So I feel that software is the key, just like how Apple did it with iOS, I want to see if Google can do that, and that's what I'm very hopeful for. And last thing before I let you talk, I think their uh, Google Assistant, it's already great. It's phenomenal. So I'm interested to see how can we make it even better mm -hmm, because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. on its own, it's phenomenal. Oh, so yeah. that's what I'm looking forward to today. Yeah, Michael, uh, I love the I love the passion. I think you hit it right on the head, specifically from the hardware standpoint. Look, the Pixel, when, the, when Google came out the first Pixel, I actually was like, oh, man, this is great because you could tell – that they were trying to do their own thing and they've done it. And you know what? People are going to, it's just always funny to me. I think tides are changed where people aren't looking to Apple now as much. We know like the general mainstream consumer, like, you know, Apple is still pretty much king perception wise. But I think in the tech community, it's like people are now like, you know, Apple, unless you innovate really big and show something, you guys have kind of stayed stagnant from the hardware side for about the past two, three years. And so you see all these inventive things from Huawei, from OnePlus, from Xiaomi, and honestly from Google. And they're the ones that are kind of raising the bar. It's just that they don't have that name to get around it. So the software is what's going to matter here. And I think that to your point, it's hardware doesn't matter as much. And that's why we're here to watch IO. So, uh, uh, you know what? Send me a message on Twitter or something. I'd love to check out your stuff and uh, be in touch, Michael. All right? Oh, really? Thank you so much. Oh, man, that, you know, friend, that just made my day because, <laughs> dude, I'm having a rough day right now. I'm driving home in traffic, but thank you. I will hit you up on Twitter. And to everybody out there, I'm sorry if I'm talking too long. I'm looking at the chat. <laughs> I apologize. I just I love this stuff. But thank you so much once again for this opportunity. 
I freaking love Tech. I love you, man. You are great. And I will definitely hit you up on Twitter. Everybody, please, if you haven't already, sign up to his Patreon. Be $2 a month. That's more than enough to help support this guy. Please sign up. I'm definitely signing up as soon as I get home. Thank you once again for this opportunity. All right, Michael. Thank you so much. Okay, everybody. Um, the keynote is looks like is it's just starting. We're gonna go to the keynote, and then what I'm gonna do from there is at least for people that are on the call line, just call back when the show ends, and then we'll talk about what happened at the show. I'm gonna close down the phone lines for now. Keynote be about an hour, but let's just jump into it right now, and uh, I'll see you all real soon. Okay? Sweet. We have an opportunity to create the future and decide what that's like. Can you see better? Whatever it is, follow that star because that's going to keep you going. Keep that flame alive. Computers recognize patterns, process speech and visual information. Perhaps someday we will really be building intelligent machines. I don't know why you're laughing at me. I see this and it feels like nothing short of magic. Reconsider your vision of the future. Take a chance and be surprised. Let me plug it in so I can show you a few. Good morning, good morning. Wonderful to be back here at Showline with all of you. Uh, it's been a really busy few months for us at Google. Uh, we just wrapped up Cloud Next at San Francisco with over 30,000 attendees, as well as YouTube Brandcast last week in New York. Of course, today is about you all, our developer community, and thank you all for joining us in person and to the millions around the world watching on live stream. I would love to say welcome in all the languages our viewers speak, but we are going to keep the keynote under two hours, especially since Barcelona kicks off against Liverpool at noon for you. <laughs> it should be an amazing game. Uh, every year at I.O., we learn and try to make things a little bit better. That's why we have lots of sunscreen. Hope the sun comes out. Plenty of water and shade. Uh, but this year, we want to make it easier for you to get around. So we are using. AR to help. To get started, open your I.O. app and choose Explore I.O. And then you can just point your phone where you want to go. We really hope this helps you get around and answers the number one question people have, where the sessions are. Actually, it's not that. They want to know where the food is. <laughs> and we have plenty of it around. We also have a couple of Easter eggs, and we hope you enjoy them as well. This is a pretty compelling use case, and we actually want to generalize this approach so that you can explore and navigate the whole world that way. There's a lot of hard work ahead, and it's a hard computer science problem, but it's the type of challenge we love. Tackling these kinds of problems is what has kept us going for the past 21 years. And it, it all begins with our mission to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. And today, our mission feels as relevant as ever. But the way we approach it is constantly evolving. We are moving from a company that helps you find answers to a company that helps you get things done. This morning, we'll introduce you to many products built on a foundation of user trust and privacy. And I'll talk more about that later. We want our products to work harder for you in the context of your job, your home, and your life. And they all share a single goal, to be helpful. So we can be there for you in moments, big and small, over the course of your day. For example, helping you write your emails faster with automatic suggestions from Smart Reply, and giving you the chance to take them back if you didn't get it right the first time. Helping you find the fastest route home at the end of a long day. 
And when you get there, removing distractions so that you can spend time with the people most important to you. And when you capture those perfect moments, backing them up automatically <laughs> so you never lose them. Simply put, our goal is to build a more helpful Google for everyone. And when we say helpful, we mean giving you the tools to increase your knowledge, success, health, and happiness. We feel so privileged to be developing products for billions of users. And with that scale comes a deep sense of responsibility to create things that improve people's lives. By focusing on these fundamental attributes, we can empower individuals and benefit society as a whole. Of course, building a more helpful Google for us always starts with search. And the billions of questions users trust Google with every day. But there is so much more we can do, do to help our users. Last year, we launched a new feature in Google News called Full Coverage. And we have gotten great feedback on it from our users. We'll be bringing full coverage directly to search to better organize results for news-related topics. Let's take an example. If you search for black hole, we'll surface the relevant top news. It was in the news recently. We use machine learning to identify different types of stories and give you a complete picture of how a story is being reported from a wide variety of sources. You can click into full coverage. It surfaces a breadth of content, but allows you to drill down into what interests you. You can check out different aspects of the story, like how the black hole got its name. You can even now see a timeline of events, and we'll be bringing this to search later this year. Podcasts are another important source of information, and we'll be bringing them directly to search as well. By indexing podcasts, we can surface relevant episodes based on their content, not just the title. And you can tap to listen right in search results, or you can save an episode for listening later on your commute or your Google Home. These like are all that. examples cool. of how we are making search even more helpful for our users, surfacing the right information in the right context. And sometimes, what's most helpful in understanding the world is being able to see it visually, to show you how we are bringing you visual information directly in search here at Saparna. Whether you're learning about the solar system or trying to choose a color scheme for your home, seeing is often understanding. With computer vision and augmented reality, the camera in our hands is turning into a powerful visual tool to help you understand the world around you. So today, we are excited to bring the camera to Google Search, adding a new dimension to your search results. Oh, actually, three dimensions, to be precise. So let's take a look. Say you're a student studying human anatomy. Now, when you search for something like muscle flexion, you can view a 3D model built by Visible Body right from the search results. Not only that, pretty cool. Not only that, you can also place it in your own space. Look, it's one thing to read about flexion or extension, but seeing it in action right in front of you while you're studying the concept, very handy. OK, let's take another example. Say, instead of studying, you're shopping for a new pair of shoes. That happens. Um, with New Balance, you can look at shoes up close from different angles, again, directly from search. That way, you get a much better sense for things like what does the grip look like on the sole, or how they match with the rest of your clothes. OK, this last example is a really fun one. So you may have all seen a great white shark in the movies. Jaws, anyone? <laughs> but what does it actually look like up close? Let's find out, shall we? 
Okay. I have Archana here with me to help with the demo. So let's go ahead, search for Great White Shark on Google. As you scroll through, you get information on the knowledge panel, facts, but also see the shark in 3D directly from the knowledge panel. Why don't we go one step further? Why don't we invite the shark uh -oh. to the stage? Whoa! <laughs> there it is. A you know, it's one thing to do read do 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 a fact, a like a great do white do can do be do anywhere between 17 feet we'll to 21 feet long. But to see it in front of you at scale, filling up the shoreline stage like a rock star, that is truly understanding its scale. OK, let's take a closer look. It's an AR shark. It won't bite. Oh, look at those layers of teeth. You know, I don't know about you all, but I'd much rather see these teeth up close in AR than in real life. <laughs> Thank you, Archana. Really excited about bringing the camera and AR capabilities to Google search. Now, sometimes, though, the things that you're interested in they're difficult to describe in a search box. So that's why we created Google Lens to help you search and do more with what you see by simply pointing your camera. We've built Lens as a capability across products so you can access it directly from the Google Assistant, but we've also built it into Google Photos and the camera app on many Android devices. People have already used Lens more than a billion times so far. And they've used it to ask questions about what they see, like what kind of flower that is, or where to get a lamp like that, or just who the artist is. One way we've been thinking about it is, with Lens, we're indexing the physical world, billions of places and products and so on, much like search indexes the billions of pages on the web. OK, today, let me show you some new ways that we're making Lens more helpful to you. Say you're at a restaurant trying to figure out what to order. Instead of going from the menu to different apps on the phone and back to the menu and so on, you can simply point your camera. Lens automatically highlights the popular dishes at this restaurant right on the menu. <laughs> And of course, if you want to know more, you can tap on any dish on the menu, and you can see what it looks like, again, at the restaurant. Yo. And of course, check out what other people are saying about it on Google Maps. By the way, when you're done eating, Lens can help pay for your meal. Not so fast. It's not picking up your tab. But it can calculate the tip and even split the total. Again, what? just by pointing your camera at the receipt, and voila. Damn, that's hot. That is hot. So you saw how we connected the menu with information from Google Maps. But we're starting to think of other ways that we can connect helpful digital information with the things in the physical world. So I'm going to give you just one example. So you're flipping through a Bon Appetit magazine, and you see a recipe you like. Soon, you can point your camera at the recipe and see the page come alive, showing you how to make the dish. We're starting to work with Jeez. more partners, like museums, magazine publishers, and retailers to bring unique visual experiences like this. There's one final area where we think that the camera can be particularly helpful to people. Around the world, there are more than 800 million adults who are struggling to read the words that they come across in their daily lives. Bus schedules, bank forms, etc. And many of them are coming online for the first time with a smartphone. So to help with that, we've integrated a new camera capability into Google Go. This is our search app for entry-level devices. Take this sign in English next to an ATM. Now, for someone who does not understand the language 
and cannot read the words, this is important information that they're not getting access to. And we think that the camera can help here. So let me show you how. So directly from the Google search bar, you can use Lens, open it, point it at the sign to hear the text read out aloud to you. Information for card holders. All customers using old proprietary magnetic stripe cards should be advised. What is nice here is that it is highlighting the words as they're spoken. That way, even if you can't read the language well, you can follow along and you understand the full context of what you see. You can also translate it into your own language. Like this. Notice that the translated text is overlaid right on top of the original sign. You know, it almost feels like the sign was written in your own language to start with. And again, you can hit listen and hear the words read out loud, this time in your own language. Información para los titulares de la tarjeta. What you're seeing here is text-to-speech, computer vision, the power of translate, and 20 years of language understanding from search all coming together. Now, our teams in India have been working with some early testers and getting a lot of feedback to make the product better. And I want to now show you how one of them is using it in her daily life. Take a look. My name is ईपी की रहने वाली हूँ मेरे तीन बच्चे आएंगे स्कूल में जाते हैं और बच्चों को होमवर्क नहीं करा सकते हैं लेकिन चलो मेरे बच्चे सियार हो गए थोड़ा सा नेक पढ़ लिख जाते कोई भी पढ़ा लिखा को काम भाव वो नहीं कर सकते हैं बार बार कहने पड़ती है उन लोगों के कि मतलब थोड़ा सा बता दिए मुझे पहली बार जैसे बच्चों को मतलब बार बार कपता नहीं आ रही थी मतलब फोटो लाई एक कप सोयाबीन बहियों में चार कप पानी डालकर उबालें तो इसने पढ़ के सुनाया है और जैसे मतलब रिपोर्ट काट रहा हो बच्चों को अंग्रेजी हिंदी गणित विज्ञान तो मुझे बहुत अच्छा लगा कि मतलब वो चीज जा चीज है मतलब जा चीज है अब तो मैं खुद के लिए बहुत कुछ काम कर लेंगे चालू खाता बचत खाता अब मुझे अब जैसे रेलवे के टिकट कटाना है तो मैं कटा सकती हूँ किसी के सारा नहीं लेने पड़ता है एक तो इसमें बहुत बेहतर है Thank you, Rumila, for testing it and giving us a lot of feedback for the team to make the product better. The power to read is the power to buy a train ticket, to shop in a store, to follow the news. It's the power to get things done. So we want to make this feature accessible to as many people as possible. So it already works in more than a dozen languages. And the teams worked incredibly hard to compress all of this tech to just over 100 kilobytes. That way it can work on phones that cost as little as $35. So we're super excited about this and all the other features across search and lens to help you throughout the day. You'll start to see these updates roll out later this month. Thank you. Thanks, Aparna. Helpfulness is also about saving time and making your day a little bit easier. That's why last year at I.O., we gave you a first look at our duplex technology. Duplex enables Google Assistant to make restaurant reservations on your behalf by actually placing a call. 
It's now available in 44 states across the US, and we've gotten great feedback, not only from our users, but from businesses as well. For us, Duplex is the approach by which we train AI on simple but familiar tasks to accomplish them and save you time. Duplex was launched with restaurant reservations on the phone, but now we are moving beyond voice and extending Duplex to tasks on the web. We again want to focus on narrow use cases to start. So we are looking at rental car bookings as well as movie ticketing. Today, when you make a new reservation online, you have to navigate a number of pages and steps, filling out information and making selections along the way. I'm sure you're all familiar with this experience. It's time consuming, and if users leave during the workflow, businesses lose out as well. We want to make this experience better for both users and businesses. So let me show you how the assistant can do it better. Say you get a calendar reminder about an upcoming trip, and you want to book a rental car. You can just ask Google, book a national car rental for my next trip. The assistant opens the national website and automatically starts filling out your information Jeez. on your behalf, including the dates of the trip. You can confirm the details with just a tap. <laughs> and then the assistant continues to navigate the site. It even selects which car you like. It's acting on your behalf and helping you save time, but you're always in control of the flow. Let's go ahead and add a car seat. And once all the details are in, you can check everything one last time and just tap to finalize the reservation. You'll immediately get a booking confirmation. It's amazing to see the assistant complete a task online on your behalf in a personalized way. It understands the dates of your trip and your car preferences based on trip confirmations in Gmail. I also want to point out that this was not a custom integration. This required no action on part of the business to implement. What you just saw is an early preview of what we are calling duplex on the web. We're going to be thoughtful and get feedback from both users and businesses to improve the experience, and we'll have more details later this year. The Google Assistant helps people around the world with all kinds of tasks, whether they are at home or on the go. But we want to build an even more helpful assistant. In order to process speech today, we rely on complex algorithms. It includes multiple machine learning models. One model maps incoming sound bytes into phonetic units. Another one takes and assembles these phonetic units into words. And then a third model predicts the likelihood of these words in a sequence. They are so complex that they require 100 gigabytes of storage and a network connection. Bringing these models to your phone, think of it as putting the power of a Google data center in your pocket. It's an incredibly challenging computer science problem. I'm excited to share we have reached a significant milestone. Further advances in deep learning have allowed us to combine and shrink the 100 gigabyte models down to half a gigabyte, wow. small enough to bring it onto mobile devices. This eliminates network latency and makes the assistant so much faster, Ooh. so fast, that tapping to use your phone would seem slow. <laughs> I think this is going to transform the future of the assistant, and I'm thrilled to bring Scott to tell you more about our next generation assistant. Hey, so Darth, this is going to be probably the best thing of the show. Well, so what I'm if we excited. could bring the AI that powers the assistant right onto your phone? What if the assistant was so fast at processing your voice that tapping to operate your phone would almost seem slow? It opens up many new use cases, and we want to show you how fast it is. Now, internally, we've been calling this the next generation assistant. Running on device, it can process and understand requests in real time. 
and deliver the answers up to 10 times faster. Now, Maggie's here, and she's going to help us test it out, starting with some back-to-back -back commands to demonstrate its speed. Now, this demo is hot off the press, so please send your positive energy over in Maggie's direction. Hey, Google. Open calendar. Open calculator. Open photos. Set a timer for 10 minutes. What's the weather today? What about tomorrow? Show me John Legend on Twitter. Get a lift ride to my hotel. Turn the flashlight on. Turn it off. Take a selfie. All right. Now, as you could see, yeah. Damn, that was, awesome. that was sick. That is so crazy. Maggie was able to open and navigate apps instantly. Now, you might have also noticed that with continued conversation, she was able to make several requests in a row without having to say, hey, Google, each time. Now, beyond an effortless way to operate your phone, you can start to imagine how the assistant fused into the device could orchestrate tasks across apps. Let's look at another demo where Meggie's chatting with a friend. He's going to ask her about a recent trip. Notice how easy it is for her to respond with her voice and even share a photo. Reply, had a great time with my family, and it was so beautiful. Show me my photos from Yellowstone, the ones with animals. Send it to Justin. All right. <laughs> yeah. Now, another example is when a friend asks you a question, and you need to look up the information to respond. Justin wanted to know when Maggie's flight arrives. When's my flight? When's my flight? Reply, I should get in around 1 PM. All right, so notice how it helped Maggie multitask more easily across different apps, saving her a lot of back and forth. Now, you can even imagine this next generation assistant handling more complex speech scenarios, like composing and sending an email. Hey, Google, send an email to Jessica. Hi, Jessica. I just got back from Yellowstone and completely fell in love with it. Set subject to Yellowstone Adventures. Let me know if next weekend works for dinner so I can tell you all about it. Send it. Uh -huh. <laughs> all right. Now, as you could see, this required the assistant to understand when Maggie was dictating part of the message versus when she was asking it to complete an action. Thanks, Maggie. Thanks, Scott. By moving these powerful AI models right onto your phone, we're envisioning a paradigm shift. This next generation assistant will let you instantly operate your phone with your voice, multitask across apps, and complete clicking your calendar will even work offline. Now, it's a very hard problem we've been solving, and I'm really excited to share the realization of this vision is not far off. In fact, this next generation assistant is coming to the new Pixel phones later this year. All right. Now, our mission is to make the assistant the best way to get things done. You just saw how we're making it much faster, but it also has to be personal enough to really help you. Now, personalized help is especially important in areas where people's preferences completely differ, like choosing what to listen to, what to do on the weekend, or even what to eat. So let's look at a recipe example. Hey, Google, what should I cook for dinner? 
Here are some recipe picks for you. Now, as you can see, the assistant picked recipes tailored to me. For example, it suggested a bourbon chicken recipe because it's helped me with barbecue recipes in the past. Now, what I really love is that different people get completely different results. We call this feature Picks for You, and it'll be launching on smart displays later this summer, starting with recipes, podcasts, and events. Now, beyond your preferences, becoming more personal means the assistant will better understand the people, places, and events that are important to you. Now, one important person in my life is my mom, who I'm going to visit right after I.O. So let's say I ask my assistant, how's the traffic to mom's house? Now, we all understand what I mean by mom's house, right? Well, if I'm in Toledo, mom's house might have meant this place, a nonprofit childcare center. In other cities, mom's house can be a restaurant or a grocery store. In fact, there's lots of things in the world called mom's house. Now, in linguistics, the process of figuring out which thing a phrase refers to is called reference resolution, and it's fundamental to understanding human language. At Google, we approach this problem using our knowledge graph of things in the world and their relationships. It's what allows us to understand something like the Starbucks near the Golden Gate Bridge. Today, we're expanding the assistant's ability to understand you better by applying those same techniques to the things in your world. We call it personal references. So if I shared my mom's contact info with the assistant, I can ask, hey, Google, what's the weather like at mom's house this weekend? Friday and Saturday in Carmichael will be partly cloudy. How long will it take to get there? With light traffic, it will take you two hours and 14 minutes to get to 123 Main Street by car. Remind me to order flowers a week before mom's birthday. All right, I'll remind you on July 3rd. And it goes beyond mom. If you've shared important people, places, and events with the assistant, you'll be able to ask for things more naturally, like show me photos of my son, or directions to the restaurant reservation, or remind me to pick up chocolates on my anniversary. And rest assured, you're always in control. You can edit or delete this information at any time in the updated You tab in Assistant Settings. Now, one place where the assistant can be especially helpful is in the car, offering a safer, hands-free way to get everything you need while you're on the road. Now, we've been focused on the main things that we all want when we're driving, to get where we're going safely, to catch up with friends, and to listen to something interesting along the way. Last year, we brought the assistant to Android Auto, and earlier this year, we added it to navigation in Google Maps. I'm happy to share, the assistant is also coming to Waze in the next few weeks. Now, I'd like to show you the future of how we're improving your mobile driving experience even more, introducing the assistant's new driving mode. Just put your phone in the car and say, hey, Google, let's drive. Driving mode has a thoughtfully designed dashboard that brings your most relevant activities front and center while you're driving, and includes suggestions personalized for you. For example, if you have a dinner reservation on your calendar, you'll see a convenient shortcut to navigate to the restaurant. Or if you started a podcast at home in the morning, once you get in your car, it'll display a shortcut to resume the episode right where you left off. Now, it also highlights top contacts, making it easy to call them or message them, and recommendations for other things to listen to. Now, once you're navigating, phone calls and music appear in a low-profile way so you can get things done without leaving your navigation screen. Hey, Google, play some jazz. Sure, check out this jazz music station on YouTube Music. Now, everything is voice-enabled, so if a call comes in, the assistant will tell you who's calling and ask if you want to answer without having to take your eyes off the road. Call from mom. Do you want to pick it up? No, thanks. But thanks for your help with the demo, Mom. All right, so best of all, with the assistant already on your phone, there's no need to download an app. Just start driving. Driving mode will be available this summer on any Android phone with the assistant. Yeah, that's good. Now, today, the Google Assistant is available on over 1 billion devices in over 30 languages across 80 countries. And with Duplex on the web, the next generation assistant, 
personalized help and assistance in the car, we're continuing to build on our mission to be the fastest, most personal way to help you get things done. Now, before I go, I want to share a little something that a lot of you have been asking for. Check this out. Stop. Now you can stop your timers and alarms just by saying stop. No Hey Google needed. And it's rolling out on smart displays and Google Homes in English-speaking locales starting today. Thanks very much. <laughs> that, was, that was a legit demo, guys. That was great. Hey, Google, open the pod bay doors. Hey, Google. Hey, Google. Hey, Google. Hey, Google. Turn on the lights. Turn on sumo. I love that. Hey, Google. Oh, Mom. I found a few restaurants near you. Order my usual from Starbucks. Ordering you a grande vanilla latte from Starbucks. I love you. I love you. OK, Google. This is a cat. The forecast is 72 and sunny. Take a selfie. <laughs> hey, Google. What's on my calendar for today? Make me laugh. How do I slice a mango? Turn on the Christmas spirit. Begin Operation Kevin. Operation Kevin underway. Show me how to make an octopus costume on YouTube. <laughs> Thanks, Scott. It's great to see the momentum of Google Assistant and how it's able to help users get things done. So far, we have talked about building a more helpful Google. It's equally important to us that we do this for everyone. For everyone is a core philosophy for us at Google. That's why, from the earliest days, search works the same, whether you're a professor at Stanford or a student in rural Indonesia. It's why we build affordable laptops for classrooms everywhere. And it's why we care about the experience on low-cost phones in countries where users are just starting to come online with the same passion as we do with premium phones. And it goes beyond our products and services. It's why we offer free training and tools through Grow with Google, helping people grow their skills find jobs, and build their businesses. And it's how we develop our technology, ensuring the responsible development of AI, privacy and security that works for everyone, and products that are accessible at their core. Let's start with building AI for everyone. Bias has been a concern in science long before machine learning came along. But the stakes are clearly higher with AI, it's not enough to know if a model works. We need to know how it works. We want to ensure that our AI models don't reinforce bias that exists in the real world. It's a hard problem, which is why we are doing fundamental computer science research to improve the transparency of machine learning models and reduce bias. Let me show you what I mean. When computer scientists deploy machine learning models, it can sometimes be difficult to understand why they make a certain prediction. That's because most machine learning models appear to operate on low-level features, edges and lines in a picture, color of a single pixel. That's very different than the higher-level concepts more familiar to humans, like stripes on a zebra. To tackle this problem, Google AI researchers are working on a new methodology called TCAF, or testing with concept activation vectors. Let me give you an example. If it's a machine learning model trained to detect zebras, you would want to know which variables were being used to decide if the image contained a zebra or not. TCAF can help you understand if the concept of stripes was important to the model's prediction. In this particular case, it makes sense. Stripes are an important predictor for the model. Now suppose a classifier was trained on pictures of doctors. If the training data was mostly males wearing coats and stethoscopes, 
then the model could inaccurately assume that being male was an important prediction factor. There are other important examples as well. Now imagine an AI system that could help with detecting skin cancer. To be effective, it would need to recognize a wide variety of skin tones representative of the entire population. There's a lot more to do, but we are committed to building AI in a way that's fair and works for everyone, including identifying and addressing bias in our own ML models and sharing tools and open data sets to help you as well. Another way we build for everyone is by ensuring that our products are safe and private and that people have clear, meaningful choices around their data. We strongly believe that privacy and security are for everyone, not just a few. This is why powerful privacy features and controls have always been built into Google services. We launched incognito mode in Chrome over a decade ago. We pioneered Google Takeout, which gives you easy controls to export your data from email, contacts, photos, all of our products, any time you choose to. But we know our work on privacy and security is never done. And we want to do more to stay ahead of constantly evolving user expectations. We've been working on a significant set of enhancements, and I want to talk you through a few. Today, you can already find all your privacy and security settings in one place in your Google account. To make sure your Google account is always at your fingertips, we are making it easily accessible from your profile photo. If you're in search, you can tap on your photo, and you can quickly access the most relevant privacy controls for search in case your data in search. Here, you can view and manage your recent activity, and you can easily change your privacy settings. Last week, we announced auto-delete controls, which you'll also be able to access right from the app. Data helps make search work better for you. And with auto-delete, you can choose how long you want it to be saved. For example, three or 18 months, after which any old data will be automatically and continuously deleted from your account. This is launching today for web and app activity. We'll be rolling it out to location history in the coming weeks. And we'll continue to bring features such as this to more controls over time. In addition, one-tap access to your Google account will be coming to our major products, including Chrome, Search, Assistant, YouTube, Google News, and Maps. And speaking of Maps, if you tap on your profile photo, in addition to finding easy access to your privacy controls, you'll find a new feature, incognito mode. Incognito mode has, a pop, has been a popular feature in Chrome since it launched, and we are bringing this to Maps. While in incognito in Maps, your activity, like the places you search and navigate to, won't be linked to your account. We want to make it easy to enter in and out of incognito, and Maps will soon join Chrome and YouTube with support for incognito, and we'll be bringing it to search as well this year. Another way we ensure your privacy is by working hard to keep your data secure. From safe browsing, which now protects over 4 billion devices every day, to using TensorFlow to significantly reduce phishing attacks in Gmail, we also encourage users to use two-step verification, because an additional layer of protection is always helpful. Today, we are making two-step verification even more convenient for everyone by bringing the protection of security keys directly into your Android phone. So now you can confirm a sign-in with just a tap. And today, it will be available to over 1 billion compatible devices. We always want to do more for users, but do it with less data over time. So we are applying the same cutting-edge AI research that makes our products better and applying it to enhance user privacy.
federated learning. This is a new approach to machine learning developed by Google is one example. It allows Google's AI products to work better for you and work better for everyone without collecting raw data from your devices. Instead of sending data to the cloud, we flip the model. We ship machine learning models directly to your device. Each phone computes an update to the global model. And only those updates, not the data, is securely uploaded and aggregated in large batches to improve the global model. And then the updated global model is sent back to everyone's device. Let me explain it with a concrete example. Take Gboard, Google's keyboard. Using on-device learning alone, when new words become popular, Gboard would not be able to suggest them until you've typed them many times. Federated learning, however, allows Gboard to learn new words, like BTS or YOLO, <laughs> yes. after thousands of people yes. start using them without Google ever seeing anything you type. Actually, with BTS, it's probably millions of people. This is not just research. In fact, Gboard is already using federated learning to improve next word prediction as well as emoji prediction across tens of millions of devices. It's still very early, but we are excited about the progress and the potential of federated learning across many more of our products. <laughs> Privacy and security are the foundation for all the work we do, and we'll continue to push the boundaries of technology to make it even better for our users. Building for everyone also means ensuring that everyone can access our products. The World Health Organization estimates that 15% of the world's population, over 1 billion people, has a disability. We believe technology can help us be more inclusive, and AI is providing us with new tools to dramatically improve experience for people with disabilities. For example, there are almost 500 million people in the world who are deaf or hard of hearing. Think of how many conversations are challenging from in-person discussions and phone calls to even experiencing videos online. A few months ago, we launched Live Transcribe, powered by Google's Cloud Speech API, to caption conversations in real time. You can leave your phone open with the app and when someone speaks to you, it transcribes their speech into text. Those who cannot or prefer not to speak can also respond by typing. I was really inspired by how the product came about. Two of our Google researchers, Dimitri and Chet, saw an opportunity to help people and collaborated to develop the app. Together with a small team of engineers and People who volunteered their 20% time, they built Live Transcribe, and it is now available in over 70 languages and dialects on Android devices. Today, we are going further and extending this technology. We are announcing a new feature called Live Caption. Live Caption makes all content, no matter its origin, more accessible to everyone. Incredible thing is that it works completely on device, so there's no delay. With one click, you can turn on captions for a web video, podcast, or even on a moment you capture at home. You like the blueberries? The blueberries? Delicious? Comes more. Um. Should they act? This is. This is. It's only possible due to our recent breakthroughs in speech recognition technology. We recently tested live caption with some users. Let's take a look. So if you hit this volume button here, and then we turn on that button, and you wow. can even, if you want to see more, you can. Oh my god. This is really amazing. It feels like, wow, it's such a a simple feature, but it has such an impact on me. It's gonna make our lives so much easier. I wake up two o'clock in the morning to walk to wake up my mom or dad to say, what are they saying on this? 
You... <laughs> That's... you can imagine all the use cases for the broader community, too. For example, the ability to watch any video if you're in a meeting or on the subway without disturbing the people around you. The Android team is going to talk a little bit later today about what made live caption possible. We are also exploring how this technology can caption phone calls. But we want to go one step further and actually allow more people to respond and accomplish tasks over their phones. As you'll see in this example, Nicole, who is deaf and prefers not to speak, can receive a call from her hairstylist. With Smart Compose and Smart Reply, she can answer the call and interact. Let's take a look. Hi, this is Nicole's assistive chat. She'll see what you say, and her responses will be read back to you, starting now. Hi, Nicole, it's Jamie. How are you? Hey, Jamie. I'm good, and you? Great. Are we still on for your 1 p.m. haircut tomorrow? Sorry, can you do 3 p.m.? Uh, yes, I can do 3 p.m. We have a lot to catch up on. I want to hear all about your trip. Perfect. Thumbs up. Great. See you tomorrow. Bye. Thumbs up, indeed. We call this new technology Live Relay. While there's still more work to do, we are excited to see how it can help people like Nicole get things done more easily. Just like with live caption, this runs completely on device, and these conversations remain private to you. We also want to help those with speech disorders or people whose speech has been affected by a stroke or ALS. Researchers from Google AI are exploring the idea of personalized communication models that can better understand different types of speech, as well as how AI can help even those who cannot speak to communicate. We call this research Project Euphonia. Let's take a look. Google has very good general speech recognition, but if you do not sound as most of people, it will not understand to you. No one's ever collected large data sets of people whose speech is hard for others to understand. People who have multiple sclerosis for GF, who had stroke, who stutter. They're not used in training the speech recognition models. I mean, the game is, is to record things. What's the temperature today? And then have it recognize things that you say that aren't in the training set. Dimitri recorded 15,000 phrases. It wasn't obvious that this was going to work. He just sat there and he kept recording. We need to make all voice interactive devices be able to understand any person who speaks to them. You can see that it's possible to make a speech recognizer to work for Dimitri. It should be possible to make it work for many people, even people who can't speak because they've lost the ability to speak. The work that Shenxing has done on, you know, voice utterances from sounds alone, you can communicate. But there might be other ways of communicating. Most people with ALS end up using an on-screen keyboard and having to type each individual letter with their eyes. For me, communicating is slow. Steve might crack a joke and it's related to something that happened, you know, a few minutes ago. The idea is to create a tool so that Steve yes. can train machine learning models himself no. to understand his facial expressions. <laughs> to be able to laugh, to be able to cheer, to be able to boo. Things that seem maybe superfluous, but actually are so core to being human. I still think this is only the tip of the iceberg. We're not even scratching the surface yet of what is possible. If we can get speech recognizers to work with small numbers of people, we'll learn lessons which we can then combine to build something that really works for everyone. 
to understand and be understood the absolute unbelievable. We are working hard to provide these voice recognition models through the Google Assistant in the future. But as you saw in Dimitri's case, this will only be possible with many more speech samples to train our models on. If you or someone you know has slurred or hard to understand speech, we'd like to invite you to submit voice samples to help accelerate this effort. Fundamental AI research, which enables new products for people with disabilities is an important way we drive our mission forward. Live transcribe, live caption, live relay, and project euphonia will ultimately result in products that work better for all of us. It's a perfect example of what we mean by building a more helpful Google for everyone. One of the most powerful ways we deliver help to our users is through our open source platforms like Android. To tell you more, I'd like to invite Steph onto the stage. It's amazing we're here to talk about Android's version 10. OK. And we get to celebrate a milestone together. Today, there are over 2.5 billion active Android devices. And today, we want to walk you through what's coming next in Android Q. Innovation, security, and privacy, the central theme of the Q release, and digital well-being. A lot has changed since 1.0. Smartphones have evolved from an early vision to this integral tool in our lives. And they are incredibly helpful. Looking ahead, we see another big wave of innovation coming to make them even more helpful. Q shows Android shaping the leading edge of mobile innovation, with over 180 device makers around the world. Driven by this powerful ecosystem, many innovations have been first on Android, from large screens to the first OLED display. And this year, display technology will take an even bigger leap with foldables coming from multiple Android OEMs. These devices open up a completely new category, which, though early, just might change the future of mobile computing. Foldables take advantage of a completely new display technology. They literally bend and fold from phone to tablet size screen. And Q maximizes what's possible on these screens. For instance, foldables are great for multitasking. So I can watch some funny videos my sister sent me while we chat about what we're going to do for my mom on Mother's Day. But the feature I'm most excited about is screen continuity. So let's say we finish chatting. It's time to head out, and I'm standing around waiting for my ride. So I start playing a game on the folded smaller screen. When I sit down and unfold, the game seamlessly transfers to the larger screen. It is so cool. And I can pick up exactly where I was playing. Now, multiple OEMs will launch foldables this year, all running Android. <laughs> Another exciting innovation is 5G. 5G networks mean consistently faster speeds with lower latency. So apps, and especially games, can target rich, immersive experiences to these 5G connected phones. And Android Q supports 5G natively. This year, more than 20 carriers will launch networks. And our OEMs have over a dozen 5G-ready phones all launching this year, and they'll all be running Android. Now, in addition to hardware innovation, we're also seeing huge firsts in software, driven by advances in on-device machine learning. Sundar showed live caption. Now, I would really like you to see it in action and then take you under the hood. Please welcome Tristan. Like many people, I watch videos without sound when I'm on the go. With captions, I can still keep up, even if I'm in a crowded space or I'm sitting in a meeting. So for me, they're super helpful. 
But for the almost 500 million people who are deaf or hard of hearing, captions are critical. Today, loads of mobile content embeds audio, from video to voice messages and everything in between. Without captions, this content is nowhere near as accessible. Live caption in Q takes audio and instantly turns it into text. Let's take a look at this video my friend Heather sent me yesterday. To turn it on, I open the volume rocker and tap the live caption button. Hey, cutie. Do you want to give your puppy a hug? Oh, oh, I guess not. Puppy is walking away. <laughs> so as you can see, these captions appear in real time over a video that would normally never have captions. You can expand them, contract them, move them up and down. It's a lot of fun. But what makes this feature so incredible is that it's entirely done on device. In fact, it doesn't need to be connected to the internet at all. If we take a look, this entire demo I've done in airplane mode. Thank you. Thank you, Justin. OK, so how is this possible? It's because of a huge breakthrough in speech recognition that we made earlier this year. This once required streaming audio to the cloud to run a two gigabyte model for processing. Now we can do that same processing on device using a recurrent neural net in just 80 megabytes. The live speech model is running on the phone, and no audio stream ever leaves it. All this protects user privacy. And this is OS-wide, which means you get those captions in all your apps and in web content, too. Now, the same on-device machine learning powers another useful Q feature, which is Smart Reply. With Smart Reply, the OS helpfully suggests what you'll type next. It'll predict the text you'll type, even emoji. And it's a huge time saver. What's really cool is this works now for all messaging apps in Android. Like in Signal, you can see the OS providing these helpful suggestions. And Smart Reply can now even predict the actions that you'll take. So say a friend sends you an address. And normally, you'd copy and paste that into Maps. That's kind of a hassle. With Smart Reply, you just tap, and it will open for you. And all this is saving you time. On-device machine learning powers everything from these incredible breakthroughs like Live Caption to helpful everyday features like Smart Reply. And it does this with no user input ever leaving the phone, all of which protects user privacy. Now, there's one more addition to Android Q that's small, but you've been asking us about for a while. And that is Dark Theme. And we're launching it in Q. <laughs> and the crowd goes wild. So you can activate it by using the quick tile or by turning on Battery Saver. And in fact, it will help you save battery. Your OLED display is one of the most power-hungry components in your phone. So by lighting up less pixels, we'll save you battery. So that's innovation. But we feel all innovation must happen within a frame of security and privacy. People now carry phones constantly. And we trust them with a lot of personal information. You should always be in control of what you share and who you share it with. And that's why the central, second area we'll cover, and the central focus of the release, is security and privacy. Now, over the years, Android's built out a huge set of protections already. File-based encryption, SSL by default, secure DNS, work profiles. And many of these were first on Android. Android has the most widely deployed security and anti-malware service of any OS, with Google Play Protect. It runs on every device, and it scans over 50 billion apps a day. In fact, in Gartner's 2019 security report, which was published this week, Android scored the highest possible rating in 26 out of 30 categories. It's ahead on multiple points from authentication to network security to malware protection and more. At the same time, we wanted to go much further. And that's why Android Q includes almost 50 features focused on security and privacy, all providing more protection, transparency, and control. So first, in Q, we've brought privacy to the top level in settings. And there, you'll find a number of important controls all in one place, activity data, location history, ad settings, and you decide what's on or off. Now, location is another place we've created tools for more transparency and control. Now, location can be really helpful, especially when you're lost in a new place. 
but it's also some of your most personal information. And you should, again, always be in control of who you share it with and how they can use it. So first, if you're wondering which apps can be accessing your location, we make it easy for you to know. With Q, your device will give you helpful reminders whenever an app accesses location when you're not actively using that app. So you can review and decide, do you want to continue sharing or not? Second, Q will give you more control over how you share location data with apps. For example, say you want to get pizza delivered. You can choose to share your location only while the app is in use. And as soon as you close, you'll stop sharing location. Finally, what if you're wondering, what kind of location do all my apps have? In Q, we've brought location controls to the forefront in settings. So you can quickly review every app and change location access with simple controls. Now, there are many, many more enhancements to security and privacy throughout the OS, like TLS v3, encryption for low-end devices, randomizing your MAC address by default, and many more. And you can read about all of these in our blog post this week. But there's one more really big thing for security. Now, your Android device gets regular up security updates already, but you still have to wait for the release, and you have to reboot when they come. We want you to get these faster, even faster. And that's why in Q, we're making a set of OS modules updatable directly over the air. So now these can be updated individually as soon as they are available and without a reboot of the device. Now, this was a huge technical challenge. We're updating these in the background the same way we're updating Google Apps. It's easier for our partners with whom we're working closely, but more importantly, it's much better for you. You can learn more about this at the session, What's New in Android? Now, there's one more thing that's changed since the early days of Android. Now, people carry smartphones everywhere because they're really helpful. But we're also spending a lot of time on phones. And people tell us sometimes they wish they'd spent more time on other things. We want to help people find balance and digital well-being. And yes, sometimes this means making it easier to put your device away entirely and focus on the times that really matter. That's why last year, we launched digital well-being tools with dashboards, app timers, flip to shush, and wind down to help you set the phone down and get to sleep at night. And these tools are really helping. App timers help users stick to their goals over 90% of the time. And users of Windown had a 27% drop in nighttime usage. If you're not using these already, I would really recommend them. But this year, we want to help even more with distraction. A lot of times, I just want to sit down and focus to get something done. And when I'm trying to do this, like working, maybe it's studying for you, I don't want email or anything else to distract me. And that's why we've created a new mode for Android. It's called Focus Mode. When I enter focus mode, I can select the apps that I find distracting. For me, that's email, the news. So now they're turned off, and I can really get to work. Those apps that distract me are disabled. But I can still keep text, because it's important to me that my family can always get a hold of me until I come out of focus mode. And then everything is back. Focus mode is coming to devices on P and Q this fall. Now, finally, I want to talk about families. For 84% of us parents, technology use by our kids is a top concern. In the US, the average age of kids getting phones is now eight. In Q, Family Link parental controls will be built right into the settings of the device. So when you set up a device for someone in your family, Family Link will help connect it to a parent. And you can review any apps that your child wants to install. After that, you can set daily screen time limits. You can check, where are the apps where my kids are spending time? And you can set a device bedtime so your kids can disconnect and get to sleep. And now in Android Q, you can set time limits on specific apps. And when your child hits that device bedtime, if you want to give them just five more minutes, now we have bonus time. Now, there's a ton more in Q that we don't have time to cover, a ton. Everything from streaming media to hearing aids to better connectivity to new gesture UI and more. So today, I'm excited to announce that Q Beta 3 is available on 21 devices. That is 12 OEMs plus all pixels. 
And that is more than double last year. We hope you head over to the link to get it on your phone because we would love to have you try it out. And now I will hand it over to Rick. Thank you very much. Thanks, Steph. Well, we've heard about some terrific innovations today in Android, AI, and the Assistant, and real breakthroughs in how we're able to help our users. I'd like to spend a few minutes and talk about how some of those come to life in our Made by Google products. Now, we continue to believe that the biggest breakthroughs are happening at the intersection of AI, software, and hardware. Whether that's a tensor processing unit, an entire data center, the phone in your hand, or a helpful smart display in your home. Let's start there. The smart home of today is fragmented and frustrating. To deliver real help in the home, you can't start with technology. You have to start with people. And we've always worked to put people first and build technology around their needs. There's no more important place to get this right than in the home. Let's take a look. Hold on to me no, as no, no, we no, go. As we roll down oh. this unfamiliar road. It's an me and Daddy. <laughs> Although this way the street of us alone. Just know you're not alone. Cause I wanna make this place your home. The trouble in my dragon. Your home is the most special place in your life, so we need to be thoughtful about the technology we create for it. By putting people first, we're going beyond the idea of a smart home to create a truly helpful home. Over the past year, we've brought the Nest and Google Teams together to deliver on our vision of the helpful home. And today, we're further simplifying things, bringing all of these products together under the Nest name. As a single team and a single product family, we're following a set of guiding principles that reflect our commitment to putting people first. Now to start, we believe technology should be easy for everyone in the home to use, whether they're five or 95. The helpful home should also be personal for everyone. With Google Assistant at the core, we can provide a personalized experience for the entire household, even in communal spaces. And the tech in your home should work together for a single seamless experience across rooms and devices. Most importantly, the helpful home needs to respect your privacy. And today, we're publishing privacy commitments for our home products that clearly explain how they work, the data we're storing, and how it's used. Our vision for the helpful home is anchored in the insistent. And as you heard from Scott, we're continuing to get more helpful over time. We want to make sure that you can get the help you need where you need it. Google Home Hub, which we're renaming Nest Hub, was designed specifically to bring the helpfulness of the assistant to any room in your house. Now, we've also been working on a new display that builds on the things Here that people go. love about Hub, but is designed for communal spaces in the home where the family gathers. Introducing Nest Hub Max. It's a new product that has a camera and a larger 10-inch display, which is perfect for the center of your helpful home. Hub Max pulls together your connected devices together into a home view dashboard where you can see your Nest cams, you can switch on lights, control your music, and adjust your thermostat. Hub Max also supports Thread. So just like Nest Connect, it communicates directly with Thread-supported devices that need a low power connection, like door locks or motion sensors. And we've designed Hub Max with an incredibly helpful camera. 
If you want to know what's going on in your home, you can choose to use it like a Nest Cam. You can turn it on when you're away from home. You can check on things right from the Nest app in your phone. And just like a Nest Cam, it's easy to see your event history, enable Home and Away Assist, and you also get a notification if the camera detects any motion or sees someone it doesn't recognize in your home. Now, video calling is easy, too, with Google Duo. The camera has a wide-angle lens, and it automatically adjusts to keep you centered in the frame. You can chat with any iOS or Android device or a PC with a Chrome browser. You can also, you also use Duo to leave video messages for members of your household. Hub Max is designed to give you full control over the camera. Nothing is streamed or recorded unless you intentionally enable it. And you'll always know when the camera is on with a green indicator light. You have multiple controls to disable camera features, and a physical switch on the back electrically disconnects the camera and the microphones. And you can see all these controls clearly on the display. Hub Max, thank you. Hub Max is designed to be used by multiple people in your home and provide everyone with the help they need in a personalized way. Now, to help with that, we've offered users the choice to enable voice match so the assistant can recognize your voice and respond directly to you. But today, we're also extending the options to personalize using the camera with a feature we call Face Match. For each person in your family that chooses to turn it on, the assistant guides you through a process of creating a face model, which is then encrypted and stored on the device. Then, whenever you walk in front of the camera, Hub Max recognizes you and shows just your information and not anyone else's. Face Match's facial re recognition technology is processed locally on the device using on-device machine learning, so the camera data never leaves the device. And in the morning, I can walk into the kitchen, and the assistant knows to greet me with my calendar, my commuting details, the weather, and any other information I need to start my day. And when I get home, Hub Max welcomes me home with any reminders that might be waiting for me. And the assistant offers personalized recommendations for music and TV shows, and I can even see if anyone's left me a video message. One of my favorite things about Hub Max is that it's a great digital photo frame. No matter what kind of day I'm having, nothing makes me feel better than seeing some of my favorite memories on this beautiful screen. And the Google Photos integration makes this whole process really simple. I can select my family and friends, and Hub Max displays the best photos of them from years ago or from earlier today. And now, with a simple voice command, sharing my favorite shots is easier than ever. The big screen also makes Hub Max the kitchen TV you've always wanted. Tell it what you want to watch, or if you need help deciding, just ask the assistant to pull up our new on-screen guide. Hub Max can stream your favorite live shows and sports on YouTube TV. But unlike your kitchen TV, it can also teach you how to cook, see who's at the front door, and play your music. You're also getting full stereo sound with a powerful rear-facing woofer. And now when the volume's up, instead of yelling at the assistant to turn it down or pause the game with the camera, it's as simple as a gesture. You just raise your hand. And Hub Max uses on-device machine learning to instantly identify your gesture and pause your media. Hub Max is a Google Assistant smart display that's also a smart home controller, a TV for your kitchen, a great digital photo frame, an indoor camera, and it's perfect for video calling. All this will be available on Nest Hub Max later this summer for just $229. And today, we're lowering the price of the original Nest Hub from $149 to $129. And we're expanding its availability to 12 new markets and supporting nine new languages. So whether you prefer a hub with a camera or without one, we have a device that'll help you in your home. 
As I said earlier, there's a fundamental difference between a smart home and a helpful home. And we're excited to unify all our products under the Nest brand to make the helpful home more real for more people. All right, next I want to talk about Pixel. And our, yeah, thank you. And I love talking about Pixel. I want to talk about our work to bring a more helpful smartphone experience to more people. A core element of Google's mission is to make technology more available and accessible for everyone. And Sundar said it earlier, we need to ensure that technology benefits the many, not just the few. But there's been a really troubling trend in the smartphone industry. To support the latest technologies, everyone's high-end phones are getting more and more expensive. So we challenged ourselves to see if we could optimize our software and AI to work great on more affordable hardware so we can deliver these high-end experiences at a more accessible price point. I want to introduce you to the newest members of the Pixel family, Google Pixel 3a and 3a XL, designed to deliver premium features at a price people will love. We didn't compromise on the capabilities and performance you'd expect from a premium device, which is why we branded them Pixel. They start at just $399. It's about half the price, half the price of typical flagship phones. And I want to introduce Sabrina to tell you more about how we did it. Thanks, Rick. Delivering premium features with high performance on a phone at this price point. It's been a huge engineering challenge, and I'm really proud of what our team has been able to accomplish with Pixel 3a. So let's start with the design. Pixel 3a follows the design language of the Pixel family, the familiar two-tone look, smooth finish, and ergonomic unibody design. It feels good in your hand, and it looks Beautiful. Pixel 3a comes in three colors, just black, clearly white, and a new color, purple-ish. <laughs> Everything looks amazing on the vibrant OLED display, and your music, your podcasts, they sound great in premium stereo sound. Pixel 3a supports Bluetooth 5.0 and USB-C digital audio, and we've also included a 3.5 millimeter audio jack. <laughs> because we've heard some people want more headphone options. But what Pixel is really known for is its incredible camera. And with software optimizations, we found a way to bring our exclusive camera features and our industry-leading image quality into Pixel 3a, so photos look stunning in any light. What other smartphone cameras try to do with expensive hardware, we can deliver with software and AI, including high-end computational photography. So here's what that means. Pixel 3a can take amazing photos <laughs> in low light with night sight. It's one of Pixel's most popular features. We've also enabled Pixel's portrait mode on both the front and rear cameras. And our Super Res Zoom applies computational photography, so you can get closer to your subject while still maintaining a high degree of resolution. And all of your beautiful photos are backed up for free in high quality with Google Photos. Pixel 3a also has the helpful features you'd expect in a Pixel. Just squeeze the sides of your phone to bring up the Google Assistant. We're using the AI in Pixel 3a to help manage your phone calls, too. I'm pretty sure we all hate getting robocalls. And Call Screen uses Google's speech recognition and natural language processing to help you filter out those unwanted calls. It's already screening millions of them. 
Now, you might remember last year, we shared our vision for using AR in Google Maps. Starting today on Pixel phones, when you use walking directions, instead of staring at that blue dot on your phone, you're going to see arrows in the real world to tell you where to turn next. We're just beginning our journey with AR and Maps, and we're really excited for Pixel users to experience this early preview. Battery life. It's one of the most important features on a smartphone. It makes sense. People need to know that their phone won't quit on them before the end of their day. Pixel 3a has adaptive battery. It uses machine learning to optimize based on how you use your phone. So you can get up to 30 hours on a single charge. And with the included 18-watt charger, you'll get up to seven hours of battery life with just 15 minutes of charging. Pixel 3a doesn't compromise on security either. It's got the same comprehensive approach as Pixel 3. On the hardware side, our Titan M security chip protects your sensitive data on the device, like login credentials, disk encryption, app data, and OS integrity. On the software side, you get the latest Google security patches and updates for three years, including Android Q this summer. So instead of getting slower and less secure over time, your Pixel gets better with every update. We think this hybrid approach provides the strongest data protection. And in a recent Gartner report, Pixel scored the highest for built-in security among smartphones. <laughs> Pixel 3a offers the complete Pixel experience, and we're proud to make it available and affordable to more people around the world. Verizon's been a great partner over the past two and a half years in the US, and we're excited to be partnering with them again for the launch of Pixel 3a. And for the first time, we're expanding our US carrier partnerships. So the entire Pixel family is now available for sale at T-Mobile, Sprint, and US Cellular. You can also get Pixel 3a from the Google Store and use it on any US carrier, including Google Fi and AT&T. Pixel 3a and 3a XL are available in 13 markets starting today. You can find more details online at the Google Store. We're really excited to have you try it out. Next, Jeff will tell you about our efforts in Google AI. But first, here's a quick look at our new Pixel. If your head's in the clouds, then what a feet for? Been stuck on the ground and I'm getting bored. Let's turn up the sound, best quit messing around. Think it's time that we choose? <clears throat> so what you want to do? Come on. And I can't sit still Not showing sure I'll be finished Cause I got no chill Pushing everybody's limits And they're like, for real? They know I'm gonna bring it But it's no big deal Cause I'm on the come up you know, Hey Google, you show me donut shops nearby Yeah, I'm on the come up Come on Think you can keep up Bring the beat back Come on Homie, what you wanna do? Can't sit around all day For real? Hi, everyone. Everything from building a low-cost premium device like the one you just saw without compromising on capabilities to developing a truly helpful assistant are all built on a tremendous amount of research and innovation under the covers. And they're examples of what we do at Google AI. Google AI is a collection of teams focused on making progress in artificial intelligence research across a wide range of different domains. We focus on solving fundamental computer science challenges in order to solve problems for people. That includes things like improving speech recognition models to answer questions faster or let you interact with your device quickly, or pushing the boundaries of computer vision to help people interact with their worlds in new ways, as you've seen today. We publish papers, release open source software, and apply our research 
to Google products. The goal is really to solve problems every day that touch billions of people. One of the things I'm most excited about is progress and language understanding. As Scott mentioned earlier, so much of our daily life depends on actually understanding language, reading traffic signs and shopping lists, writing emails, communicating with the people around us. We'd really want computers to have the same fluency with languages that we do, not just understand surface forms of the words, but actually understand what sentences mean. Unlocking that would get us closer to our mission of organizing the world's information and making it universally accessible and useful. In the past few years, we've made major strides. Take teaching a machine to answer questions like this one about Carlsbad Caverns, a national park in New Mexico. Only recently, the state-of-the-art language uh, architecture for language understanding was something called a recurrent neural network, or RNN. RNNs process words sequentially, one, one after another. They work well for modeling short sequences like sentences, but they struggle to make abstract associations, like knowing that stalactites and stalagmites are natural formations and that cement pathways, for example, are not. In 2017, we made a leap forward with our research on transformers, models that process words in parallel. One year later, we used it as a foundation for a technique we called bidirectional encoder representations from transformers. It's a bit of a mouthful, so we just call it BERT. BERT models can consider the full context of a word by looking at the words that come before and after it. They're pre-trained using plain text from the web and other textual sources. To do that, we use a process to train it that's a little like the word game of Mad Libs. We hide about 20% of the input words, and we train the model to guess those missing words. You can actually try this at home with a bit of text that you have. Hide a few words and see if you can guess what they are. That's effectively what we're doing. This approach is much more effective for understanding language. When we published the research, BERT obtained state-of-the-art results on 11 different language processing tasks. Fast forward to today, and we're excited to see how BERT can help us answer more complex questions that are relevant to you, whether that's getting the flight time from Indiana to Honolulu, learning a new weightlifting exercise, or translating between languages. Research like this gets us closer to technology that can truly understand language. We're now working with product teams all across Google to see how we can use BERT to solve more problems in more places. We're excited to bring this to people around the world to help them get the information they need every day. All this machine learning momentum, though, wouldn't be possible without platform innovation. TensorFlow is the software infrastructure that underlies our work in machine learning and artificial intelligence. When we developed TensorFlow, we wanted everyone to be able to use machine learning, so we made it an open source platform. And while it's been essential to our work, we've been amazed to see what other people outside of Google have used it for all kinds of different things. We've seen engineers at Roma Tre University in Italy parsing handwritten medieval manuscripts. We've seen coders in France colorizing black and white photography. We've even seen companies developing fitness sensors for cows. <laughs> the work that people are doing is really inspiring to us. It pushes us to keep asking ourselves, how can machine learning crack open previously unsolvable problems in order to help more people? One example is our work in the field of healthcare. We're really optimistic that our research can create real-world impact in medicine by improving solutions and establishing new diagnostic procedures. To share more, here's Dr. Lily Peng from the Google AI healthcare team. Thanks, Jeff. So as a doctor, what I care about most is improving patients' lives. And that means good care and accurate diagnoses. That's why I was so excited two years ago at I.O. when we shared our work in diabetic retinopathy. 
This is a complication of diabetes that puts over 400 million people around the world at risk for vision loss. Since then, we've been piloting this work with patients in clinical settings. Our partners at Verily recently received European regulatory approval for the machine learning model, and we have clinical deployments in Thailand and in India that are already screening thousands of patients. In addition to diabetes, one of the other areas we think AI can help doctors is in oncology. Today, we'd like to share our work on another project in cancer screening, where AI can help catch lung cancer earlier. So lung cancer causes more deaths than any cancer. It's actually the most common causes, uh, cause of death, mortality, uh, of death globally, accounting for 3% of annual mortality. We know that when cases are diagnosed early, patients have a higher chance of survival. But unfortunately, over 80% of lung cancers are not caught early. Randomized controlled trials have shown that screening with low-dose CTs can help reduce mortality, but there's opportunity to make them more accurate. So in a paper we are about to publish in Nature Medicine, we describe a deep learning model that can analyze CT scans and predict lung malignancies. To do it, we trained a neural network with de-identified lung cancer scans from our partners at the NCI, the National Cancer Institute, and Northwestern University. By looking at many examples, the model learns to detect malignancy with performance that meets or exceeds that of trained radiologists. So concretely, how might this help? Very early stage cancer is minuscule and can be hard to see, even for seasoned radiologists, which means that many patients with late stage lung cancer have subtle signs on earlier scans. So take this case, where an asymptomatic patient with no history of cancer had a CT scan for screening. This scan was interpreted as normal. One year later, that same patient had another scan. It picked up a late stage cancer, one that's much harder to treat. So we used our AI system to review that initial scan. So let's be clear, this is a tough case. We showed this initial scan to other radiologists, and five out of six missed this cancer. But our model was able to detect these early signs one year before the patient was actually diagnosed. One year. And that year could translate to an increased survival rate of 40% for patients like this. So clearly, this is a promising but early result. And we're very much looking forward to partnering with the medical community to use technology like this to help improve outcomes for patients. Now I'll hand it back to Jeff. Thanks, Lily. The same technologies that you saw, just saw driving healthcare innovation have applications across almost every field imaginable. Our AI for Social Good program brings together our efforts to use AI to explore and address some of the world's most challenging problems. Last year, we announced the program and its two pillars, research and engineering, and building the external ecosystem. Let's talk first about research and engineering. One project where we're working that's already creating impact is our work on flood forecasting. Floods are the most common, deadliest natural disasters on the planet. Every year, they affect up to 230 million people across the world, more than storms and earthquakes combined. 20% of flood fatalities happen in India alone. This is a problem that we're even seeing this week with the impact from Cyclone Foni. Floods prevent kids from being able to play in their neighborhoods or parents from protecting and providing for their families, often because they don't have enough advance warning. And without consistent, accurate warning systems, people are prone to ignore warnings and be unprepared. That's especially detrimental in areas hit with annual monsoons. That's why, last fall, we shared our work on flood forecasting models that can more accurately predict flood timing, 
location, and severity. Through a partnership with India's Central Water Commission, we began sending early flood warnings to the phones of users who might be affected. Today, we're thrilled to announce the expansion of our detection and alerting system for the upcoming monsoon season. The expanded area will cover millions of people living along the Ganges and Brahmaputra River areas. Not only are we increasing the area of coverage, but we're also better forecasting where the floods will hit hardest. Through a new version of our public alerts, people can better understand whether they'll be affected so they can protect themselves and their families. Our model simulates water behavior across the floodplain, showing the exact areas that will be affected. We combine thousands of satellite images to create high-resolution elevation maps using a process similar to stereographic imaging to figure out the height of the ground. We then use neural networks to correct the terrain so it's even more accurate. And then we use physics to simulate how flooding will happen. We also collaborate with the government to receive up-to-date stream gauge measurements and send forecasts in real time. We're excited to continue working with partners to increase the accuracy and precision of these models, which we hope will make people safer from flooding all around the world. Research like this is critical. But we also know that AI will have the biggest impact when people from many different backgrounds all come together to develop new solutions to problems they see. That's why the second pillar of our AI for Social Good program is to build the external ecosystem. We want to empower everyone to use AI to solve problems they see in their communities. Last year, we partnered with Google.org to launch the Google AI Impact Challenge. It was a call for nonprofits, social enterprises, and universities to share their ideas for using AI to address societal challenges. We've received applications from 119 countries across six continents, representing all kinds of sizes and types of organizations. Today, we're really excited to announce the 20 selected. We even have a few of them with us today. Let's give them a warm welcome. Here's the list of organizations. These organizations are working on some of the world's most meaningful issues. La Fondation Médecins Sans Frontières is using image recognition to help medical staff analyze antimicrobial images in order to prescribe the right antibiotics for bacterial infections. New York University, in partnership with the Fire Department of New York City, is building a model to help speed up emergency response times. This could really improve public health and safety. And Makerere University in Uganda will use AI to create a high-resolution monitoring network to shape public policies for improving air quality. We'll be supporting our 20 grantees in bringing these ideas to life. We're providing $25 million in funding from Google.org, as well as coaching and resources from teams all across Google. Congratulations to all our grantees. As we head into the next decade, I'm really excited about what's to come. There are so many promising avenues for fundamental research. For instance, machine learning models today, typically we, are, we can get them to be good at solving individual tasks. But what if they could generalize across thousands of tasks, solving new problems faster and with just a few examples to learn from? The keys to progress on these kinds of research problems are those most human characteristics perseverance, and ingenuity. As you heard Sundar mention at the start of the day, we're moving from a company that helps you find answers to a company that also helps you get things done. And all the products we showed you today share a single goal, to be helpful. At the same time, we want to ensure that the benefits of technology are felt everywhere, continue to uphold our foundation of user trust, and build a more helpful Google for everyone. To everyone joining us on the live stream, thank you for tuning in. And to everyone here with us in the audience today, welcome to Google I.O. 2019. Thank you, and enjoy the rest of I.O.
righty, yo. All righty, everybody. So there we go. Basically, Google I.O. 2019 wrapped up, at least for the keynote standpoint. Um, what I did want to say is that if you guys and gals want to be a part of the show and kind of talk a little shop, we obviously have the number right here. It's in the description. Also, right up here, 844-811-9561. We just talk a little shop about what happened, what you liked, what you didn't like, and uh, just kind of see. Let me just refresh our call line. I think that the things that stuck out to me the most, quite honestly, uh, obviously the Google Assistant now being on device and the speed and the accuracy of how that was the most impressive demo by far. The Google Lens, to me, the one of the things that I wanted to see from Google Lens this um, at this keynote was, so far, Google Lens has kind of been a feature that's hidden, you know, off to the side and not at the forefront. So. I just want to see how quickly accessible it is. If you can get to Google Lens by just like a swipe up or if it's like a hot press, then, then I'm okay with it. But if you have to still like go into an app and then go over to the side and then pull up the Google Lens and like the camera, that's that's not the same as just making it that easy. So those are obviously the two big highlights. Um, maybe contrary to popular opinion, I personally, because I've used a Google Home Hub and I've wanted a bigger screen and one with a camera, I actually like what the Nest Hub is doing, and I like how smart it is. It's not for everyone. I'd be the first to admit it, but I actually like that product. And then when I see that product, knowing that Amazon has their Echo Show, Facebook has their Portal, Google has their Home Hub, quite honestly, I think about like, geez, you know, just because we know Apple will sometimes just enter a market knowing that, okay, there's enough out there and they can just sell a bunch of their ecosystem, maybe they should just do one already. But I think out of those three we know the echo has the most compatible smart home devices but i really do like um, what they did with the nest hub and then the pixel 3a 3xl not too much from a standpoint of the price is great the features are still great but i don't know anyone here right now that is that that puts them over the hump and they're willing to go buy one so maybe you'll let me know if you're one of those people that said you know what i'm gonna get a 3a or a 3xl i get what they're doing with the mid-range price but I think a lot of people will typically wait out for a flagship. This is maybe more appealing to obviously other countries as well. And you know, the U S but I just, for me, it's not like, okay, just cause you have a 30 hour battery life, I'm going to go buy one. I'm kind of not. So let's go check in first here. It looks like, and uh, I'll see if um, she can hear me. Okay. It looks like Karen, are you calling in from the eight one four Karen? Can we hear you? Okay. Yeah. Hey there. What's up? What's your name? Yeah. Again? I can Sorry. hear you. It's Kiernan. It's oh, okay. Kiernan. Sorry about that. All the time. Call, call, call screen. You okay, so I want to. Yeah, so one quick announcement. Yes. Um, I'm on a Razor phone too. <laughs> <laughs> you want you want a anyway. Razor phone? Razor phone too? Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Fact that it wasn't supported for Android Q made me kind of sad. Yeah, I mean it. It, it is. Know? It's kind of the way of Android, right? With its support for devices and. I, I thought it was interesting how they kept on saying yeah. we have 2.5 billion devices, but how many of those, the actual percentage of those devices running the last yeah. two versions of Android is actually really slim. Yeah, because if you go like into what, a couple years ago, there was a study done, like a graph. It, it was like nougat, and most of the devices did it, like 3% was on, you know, Oreo at the time. Yeah. It is crazy to think about how staggered the, uh, Start phone industry is and like the guy previously the last person he talked about how android is, has so many capabilities i feel like it's kind of limited in terms of sometimes because you don't get those updates right away mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, you, and you hear people talk about all these great features that you don't ever see sometimes on these devices because either they're blocking it behind the paywall of the pixel devices or you're getting the fact that you have to wait how many years for you to get Android Pie or oh, yeah. Q, whatever they're going to call you. So, yeah, so the event. Um, what would you get? What'd you give it? Let's see. What do you give it? Like, let's say, let's say a scale of one to five. What, what do you think? I'm going to give it a three to four. Okay. Because last year, it, it was a lot better than last year. I feel like they covered a lot more things. I was actually genuinely excited mm -hmm. most of the event because. There's a lot of things that they're doing better than what it seemed like last year. Yeah. And especially with, um, I tried using screen call. It doesn't work for me specifically yet. It's I having audio issues, but, but how they, you know, implemented all this new stuff, especially with like all the 
new like voice recognition features that they're putting in all the apps. It's really good mm -hmm, in mm -hmm. terms of and how they're just helping more people access, you know, the phone or technology, making it more accessible to the consumer is like such a great thing. What was the best thing you saw from the keynote for you personally? I feel like a lot of the privacy stuff and AI stuff was pretty cool. Yeah. And I just like the Android Q is in general is looking to be very good. So like it's like the iOS 12 of Android. Yeah, yeah. You know. I think the And you know, um Oh, go ahead. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, no, and it's so great that Google now is trying to put privacy ahead because we've heard reports of Google, you know, collecting user data. Actually, for school, I did a paper on this. So it was really interesting to see how they use data in a sense. And this would have been great. A lot of this stuff now would have been great for the paper, explaining what benefits it would be using this data and data that they've collected since they're such a big um, presence in technology. Yeah, I think, I think the other part about it, which I thought was a different theme from Google, is they were making a point like, Here's the thing where when I talk about Facebook and Google, yes, they both collect so much of our data and we choose to give that data to them. But the difference is that I feel, and this is again, perception and sometimes perception is reality. Facebook feels like a lot of young people that are creating things and not really thinking about the consequences or caring about them until it happens and it's too late. We've seen how they've handled, you know, personal information and ads. I mean, they're, they're not even, they're not thinking about, they're just like, let's just make this cool tool where Google is a little more grown up. We know they have our stuff. It doesn't make any of us necessarily feel better, but I do personally feel better that I feel like the people at Google in general are taking more care and prioritizing more responsibility around our data. Even though they do have all of it, they at least are being more careful with it in general compared to Facebook where I just, I'm not gonna, I think yeah. the Facebook portal is really cool, but I would never buy that product because it's a Facebook product. And until they change that, yeah. until they change how they run things and prove it to me, which is hard, um, I wouldn't buy it. But Google was really deliberate about yeah, it when they're talking about their Nest Hub all the, and their phones, all the content and all the information you give it stays on device take, and is encrypted. Before, they didn't talk like that in the past. But you know, I think that's definitely taken a page of the story from Apple. And everyone, again, goes back and forth taking kind of bits and nuggets of it. But I think it's important for them knowing that they have so much of our data to show us that they're at least – doing the best to be responsible with it. Yeah, because like you said, the trust, you, it's pretty much building a wall. You got to make it sturdy. And if you don't make that wall sturdy, it's going to keep coming down until you build it great, good enough. And then people will trust that this build, your building will stand and you'll have, you know, some kind of trust, trustworthiness, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. if that makes any sense. No, it does. And so. I feel like the, the Nest Hub having the physical switch and it electrically turns off the stuff is much better. I mean, I get, I think the face, I don't remember if the Facebook portal has anything to turn off the microphone or not. I know the Alexa does. I, I had the Alexa for a bit because mm -hmm. um, in the U.S. Dish was having an offer where you could get a free Echo Dot, you know, that kind of thing. But it was, it was still weird because. You know, like thinking, being on Facebook, you know, it's like, when am, when is my turn to be hacked? When am, when's my data going to be breached, you know, or has it already happened? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, because, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, like recently, just my Twitch account got hacked. And it's like, you, you can't, nowadays, it's really hard to get your account back. The only way I was able to get back my Facebook was like, thankfully, Facebook mm -hmm. was actually useful to me for once, but, <laughs> so... <laughs> All right. Well, hey, thank you. Thank you so much for calling. You know, I really appreciate it, Karen. And uh, I'm going to I'm going to yeah. get to some other calls um, right now. But I just want to yeah. say thanks hey, for tuning more, in. One more thing. Yeah. What's up? Before we go. Yeah. Pixel 3. What do you think? Did you think it um, kind of cuts into the Pixel 3 too much? The, the Pixel 3a cutting into the Pixel 3? Is that what you're asking me? Yeah. I mean, I think that the Pixel 3 was arguably and even reports have said it wasn't google's most successful phone i think part of it has to do with it was basically you could either only buy it from their website or verizon and they show that they're at least making the pixel a available at t-mobile sprint and verizon like physical retail locations in u.s cellular so that's going to help yeah. it 
I don't. I think that they're already past the Pixel Three. Like they're already looking forward at. Uh, let's just call it the Pixel Four right now. Everything they showed us is going to be on the Pixel Four. So, from saying it, it's cutting into it. I think they're already looking forward and like, hey, you know what? The Pixel Three happened. We're gonna do these mid-range phones, and then we'll have the new stuff coming out in September, October. And I, I, yeah. I highly doubt today someone's going to say, I'm going to wait for the Pixel because the Pixel 3, they already made up their mind if they were going to buy a Pixel 3 or not already be, since it launched, what, seven, eight months ago. So I don't think it's really going to cut into it too much. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm going to definitely have to follow you on Twitter. I don't think I followed you yet. Oh, man. No, anyone I appreciate watching, watching. This man is great. <laughs> I haven't watched him too much, but he seems like a very good guy and he knows what he's up to. So. Oh, man. I, ho I hope you guys like no problem. So and, much love, yeah, man. Yeah, it was actually the whole event. Like, I just had it playing in the background, you know? Right on. I was working right on. on some designer stuff. So I was working on some logos and stuff. So. Good stuff, man. Keep the passion alive, all right? Yeah. And, and call, call in any time. You know, I do live streams for all the tech stuff. So call in any time, Karen, all right? Yeah, you have this line open for every stream? Yeah, always. Oh, cool. Yeah, I'll definitely have to set a reminder then. Turn on that bell. <laughs> Hit that Pop bell, off. baby. <laughs> all right. We'll see you soon. Take care. All right. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Peace. Peace. All right. Let's get into our next Peace. call. This looks like, um, again, sometimes the call software uh, gets the name incorrectly. The number is right here on the screen that you can call in to talk about what happened at Google. I have, it looks like it could be Kim from the 203. Is that correct? Uh, close. It's a cam, cam. from uh, 203. Yep. You know, it's that, it's that robot. I'm going to blame the robots. All right. It's not my fault. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a problem. Thanks for calling in. Man. Uh, hey, man, I'm a long time listener, oh. long time follower, uh, first time caller. I appreciate what you do. And um, I just wanted to, to ask you about uh, a couple of things. One was uh, the aesthetics of the 3A XL. I noticed that they kind of went back to the look of the 2XL without the notch. I want to know uh, what your <laughs> thoughts were about that. And <laughs> oh, and, and you're going to ask And some then uh, some just some. Uh, yeah, and then just uh, I noticed there was a few glaring omissions from uh, the I.O. event, you know, in particular, like uh, they didn't talk about gl uh, Gladia or uh, what's Stadia, it called? Stadia. Stadia. Yes, the gaming, the gaming they didn't platform. Talk yeah, they didn't talk about that, and they didn't talk about um, Android Auto or the Android Automotive. And uh, I just wanted to know what you thought about that. I thought these products were going to be kind of – you know, being pushed this year, but if they're going to talk about them later, then it's not looking like they're going to be ready for prime time this year. What yeah, do you I, think? I think so. Um, first of all, with Google for Android Auto, I know that they're having workshops there. I think that typically, even in past IOs, they really haven't shown too much um, from the Android Auto side. I Really, they were actually showcasing more um, that driving mode on your phone, and I'm wondering if they're because of how they've seen people and the adoption rates of how much they're actually using Android Auto. I do feel like more people, depending on what cars they're getting, they're not buying a car because it's Android Auto or CarPlay compatible. If it happens to be, it happens to be. But I do feel like most people are just mounting their phones on their car, having it nearby and using it that way. And so maybe, you know, even though Android Auto is important to them in some ways, if, if they were going to showcase something and they were ready to, they would have shown it today. And they didn't, and they really focus on the phone's driving mode. So, you know, we'll see how they how that evolves. I think also we've there was a time where talking about like the car systems um, and OSs was were really hot, and I feel like that momentum has died down as well. So, we'll see what they have to offer there. At least, mm -hmm. and then in response to Google Stadia, I think the main reason why we didn't see anything, and I didn't expect to see something here, is only because not only is it really more specific to gaming, and they did the announcement at the uh, Game Developers Conference. But we know that E3 is coming yeah. up in June. And if there was any time to at least announce an actual price and an actual launch day, it would probably be make more sense to do it then instead of now. And maybe like a week before E3, but really do it more around the time that people are talking about and thinking about gaming. Um, I'm super, super curious about what they do with Stadia because, you know, the sometimes you're like, if it sounds too good to be true – Maybe it is, but I really, I actually want, <laughs> I want it to happen, right? I think that what they were talking about at a Google I.O., or sorry, at the Game Developer Conference was fascinating how it's all going to be done basically in the cloud. And that, we'll see how it plays out, right? But I think that 
That's one of the most yeah. interesting platforms coming. People, you know, are saying, oh, you don't need a PS5 or a new Xbox. I'm like, well, do we want Stadia. We need to see if Stadia can deliver on their promise before we start really jumping to conclusions. What do you What do you think about Stadia? Yeah. I'm excited about it. I mean, I've I've been a big fan of uh, streaming games. Like, uh, I used to have the uh, service on live, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, which was yep. like one of the earlier uh, tries yep. at, at you know doing this type of thing. And um, you know, it was it was okay. You know, it had a lot of problems, but you know, we've come a long way as far as broadband speeds go. So I think uh, and Google, you know, they're you know one of the top companies. Exactly. So hopefully they have something up their sleeve that that uh is gonna blow us away i'm i'm positive for it you know i'm excited about it as well yeah i think that like you to your point you know they're they're bragging about their infrastructure they're gonna have like seven thousand five hundred like nodes to like deliver this content everywhere um at a high fidelity and again i think the other question is what level of interconnection internet connection do you really have to have right is it going to be good enough for kind yeah. of the standard package you buy or is it like most people, you, you get the business plan that ups ups it to a potential, you know, gigabit speeds. Like, what do you really need to pull off Stadia? And then the third part of the equation is always in gaming is what games are going to actually be available? Who's going to jump on that platform? Because they could have the best dang, like, platform without games that we care about. And that's the other part of the equation, right? Uh, what What's going to happen from the gaming standpoint? Yeah, the inter- one of the interesting things I found from IO was uh, they were talking about um, the way that they've used compression to like make some of these programs really small, like the translate and the live, uh, the live, you know, translating or transcribing to like a hundred kilobyte file yeah. so that you could use them on you know thirty dollar phones. So I mean that's very compelling, and I think that if they can apply some of that technology, you know, to this streaming stuff, I mean, that could make the world, a world of difference. So, I mean, I don't know how far they've taken it, but, you know, I'm hoping for the best. Did you like the, you know, people haven't said it yet, but did you like the Google Assistant demo, the on-device Google Assistant demo? That was honestly, I was like, ser- I, I posted on Twitter basically the meme of like uh, Jor- Jordan Peele like sweating bullets, like li- live look at Siri right now because that's taking that assistant to the next level. I mean, the response in this one was crazy. It was crazy. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it's just, it's amazing. You know, it's already so good right now, but, you know, there's that little latency where, you know, we live in this world where we want everything right away. And them taking that latency out of it is just, it's a huge thing. I mean, I use my Google Assistant. I have a Pixel 2 XL, and I use it all the time. And, I mean, with this thing, the way they've done it where you don't have to keep saying, okay, Google, to keep doing, you know, other things with it, I mean, that's going to change. That's that's a big, a big step forward, you know, where people are going to be like, oh, I don't need to even, you know, use my hands. I can just talk to my phone and it pretty much does everything I needed to do. Yeah, I mean, my so assumption- that's, that's going to be yeah, sorry a about giant that. threat to these to uh, Apple. You know, no problem. You, you know, like it is in this business, like whenever something is just faster to use and more convenient and uh, and then nothing really compares yeah. to like, like, for example, if you know, for time out, like fingerprint scanners and stuff, Touch ID was really fast, and then Face ID is kind of inconsistent at times, and you re- and then you miss how mm-hmm. fast it is. And when you get something that fast, and if it works as reliable reliably as it showed, you're not gonna want to go back, right? And so, uh, it was. I thought, yeah. I thought it was super super impressive, and hopefully, you know, it delivers. But you know, like you said, even the compression. I think they what did they say it was? It went from like a hundred gigs to like point to half a gig. On their phone just to fit all that stuff yeah impression for the google system to live on device now i'm just like i'm like all right i'm getting hype right now <laughs> yeah i mean it's incredible you know I, and it's it's got to be scary for you know for apple i mean one of the things like i use uh, alexa sometimes on my phone with the uh, amazon music and i'm always impressed by the speed of it like i always feel like it's a little bit faster than uh than the assistant and also Siri, you know, when you use Siri, you can kind of just talk to her in one cohesive sentence as opposed to, you know, doing the pause like you have to do right now with assistant. And that's a, that's a, a little bit of a plus. Yeah. But now that they're doing this, you know, it's, it's just like, plus the fact that their assistant is the best in the game. I mean, it's going to be hard to beat that. Yep. All right. Well, Hey, uh, 
Cam, thanks so much for calling in. Really appreciate it, bro. That was great. Yeah, man. Thank you for having me on. All right. Thank you. Until next time. And, uh, keep doing what you're doing. You're doing a great thing. Thank you. Thank All right. you. All later, right. man. Later. Okay. So later. people are like, oh, yo, your, your, your mic wasn't. Yeah. I had to change. I had to change. Um, I had to change my microphone. Uh, I realized it was low. Okay. Let's go. Uh, we have about five, four or five more calls um, in the queue. I'm going to bang through those and then we're going to call the day because I've got to do some more video stuff. But thank you so much for hanging out. Let's get into our friend from the 708. I don't have a name, but you're on. We're talking Google I.O. 2019. Welcome. What's up? What's up, Brian? It's your boy Viper. How you doing, man? Oh, Viper! What's up, baby? <laughs> That's right, bro. How you doing, man? Good, good, good. What How do you, you what you want to chit chat about? Thank you. Thanks for calling in, man. Appreciate it. Oh, no problem, man. No problem. So, uh, should watch the show a little bit earlier today, and it was um, it was very good. Was Thank you, man. Thank a lot you. of good stuff going on. Yeah, always, always. What what kind of stuck out for so you we'll from the keynote? Um. I think that the uh, the new Pixel phones, um, the fact that they're like starting at four hundred bucks mm -hmm. and they're going to be available on all carriers in the U.S., pretty major deal. Yeah, I think that Google it's it's a good sign moving forward because, like I said, one of the things that has hurt Google's phones. First of all, it took them a while to build their own hardware and do their own software, which has actually been from all. I mean, I have a Pixel Two XL. I used a three. It's been a success. Like it's been a great product, but. People aren't exposed to it. If you don't have them in a store, in a store, no one's gonna see it. And you, can, I'm not gonna tell my mom or dad or relative like, "Hey, go on the website and check it out." It's not gonna happen that way. So I think that was a big win, and it's probably going to happen when they release their next phone in fall, whatever we call, it, you know, the Pixel Four or whatnot. So um, huge win for them there, absolutely. No doubt, like you said, you um, it's hard to recommend a phone that you can't physically <laughs> see and touch in a carrier store. So, like you said, the fact that it's available in all carrier stores, definitely a big win, no doubt. Yeah, yeah. What did you like at the? What else did you like from the keynote? Um, <laughs> I think me and you both commented on it on Twitter, but uh, Siri over there sweating bullets right now, man. I'm they should you. be. <laughs> they should be. I, I the you way, know, the way Google. Whew, I think people people mistake me for being a hater. Look, I'm I'm only being hard on it because everything else out there is so much better and Siri was first the game. So my my the thing that I've been saying for years and I for people that listen to me and understand is like they should blow up Siri. They probably are I know they hired the head from Google AI, John Gian Andrea. <laughs> they need to blow that thing up, build it from scratch because it's just not good enough fundamentally how it was put together. And until they do that, and yeah, fine, two steps take two steps back to one step forward. That's okay, but all these assistants are eating their lunch. And when you saw what the Google Assistant did today, it's like you're not going to see anything close to that at a WWDC 2019. You're not. There's no way. And not so, at, not at all. Not at all. And even from a fundamental standpoint of with HomeKit, Apple is just isn't even nearly compatible with as many uh, smart home devices because they don't open up. I think the last time um, we had looked at the numbers. Amazon Echo's platform was somewhere around 12,000. Google Home was around 5,000. And Apple's was somewhere around like under the 500, like compatible smart home devices because they're so locked down with HomeKit. That's not going to cut it. It's just not going to cut it. So they got a lot no, of work to do. Not at they got all, a lot of work to do. No doubt, especially with the advance of home automation, man. I mean, like you said, Siri needs to pick it up, but. Like, I think you got the right idea. They just, they need to blow it up and start over because they're getting annihilated right now. They are, they are absolutely. So, um, Viper, do you have anything else you want to talk about? Um, otherwise, I'll go to the next call, but if you have one more thing you want to chit-chat about, I'm game. No, man, I don't want to hold you. Man, I know the people are waiting, man. I know I don't want to be one of the people that only hold for like 20 minutes, so I'm going to let you go, bro. You know what to find me. <laughs> all right, baby. Hey, good talking to you. Take care, all right? You too, man. All right, cool. Viper in the house. Thanks so much for calling in. Um, let's go here. It looks like an old friend from the beginning of the show. We got three more calls left before we wrap this up. Michael, are you there, my man? Hey, hey, man. Hey. I'm back. He back. back. What's up, baby? <laughs> I'm all right, man. I'm, I'm going to do this fast because uh, I got to get ready to go to school. So uh, I don't want to waste too much time. All I got to say about this event, it was pretty good. And uh, I was definitely surprised with the software end, and I'll explain later. And um, for the most part, all I got to say is this. Apple, the ball is in your court. <laughs> the, ball's in their, the ball has been in their court for a while. And, you know, they have the audience. They have the ecosystem. But, man, that's the thing. 
if people mm -hmm. it's i hope i mean the thing is that that assistant uh, google has made it available on apple hardware through uh their software app but because this is now they've gotten to the point where they have a physical chip on their phone that does all this the and i think it's important and i think it was smart that they do this they shouldn't give this gift away to other phones they should keep it on their own stuff and let people find out about them because it's they're not going to find out any other way. And so if they do, as time goes on, evolve to be kind of the de facto voice assistant, it's not there yet from a penetr you know, audience adoption standpoint, but it is the smartest assistant out there. They've got something going there for them, and that, that is a true differentiator. So I, I, ho I hope it helps them and helps Apple be like, oh, we got to step it up. But Apple, Apple is super, super behind in this space right now. Oh, 100%. It's there, bad. No it's doubt. bad behind. It's not even I'm, good. It's bad. <laughs> yeah, but you know what's funny is like, um, this is coming, like me, I'm an a Apple user. I use yeah, everything Apple. And for me to see the, the competition, and even like you just said, it's kind of amazing at just how far the competition is. And considering that WWDC is literally a month away, mm -hmm. you really got to ask yourself, what can Apple do? Like, what can they do to kind of make – because, look, they're out of touch with their customers personally, yeah. and I don't think they're listening enough because they claim they're listening. But if you look at the software, that's the only thing I think that they're listening towards because iOS 12 is a good update. I think that's a good update for the iPhone. But they really need to listen more because the average consumers, they want their voice to be heard because if you're going to pay so much money for a device, you may better make damn sure you're being heard if you got – something going on yeah and i think i think what people are starting to learn is that look apple will you know forever say like we care about your privacy all the privacy stuff is done on device and that is absolutely important but now what you're seeing is google's like hey not only are we really smart and yeah we know a bunch a lot about you all the stuff that's going to happen on your phone just like apple now is only going to happen on your device and it's going to be secured there you know it, for the most part. And so now now Apple has this story where they're saying, hey, uh, we keep everything on device. Uh, it's secure there. But now it's like, but our software still isn't even as good. And so that's that's where, mm -hmm. are they going to have to open it up or they just, they really just have to go back to the table? And these, you know, again, I'm not piling on them. These people that are doing those things are smarter than I will ever be because I'm not, I don't know anything about, I can't create my own AI. I mean, I'd try, but... Look, I'm just saying where they are in the competitive <laughs> landscape, and I get I'm fortunate enough to be able to talk about this. They need to do something, and they're already light years behind, and the gap is getting even bigger now. Today, you can see, and I don't, you know, what are they gonna say like at at WWDC? Hey, we added a few new third party partners that are compatible with Siri, so you can use their apps. You're just like, bro, it's gotta be more than Absolutely. that. Absolutely, it's and gotta you know be more than that. Um, I only got. I only got two. I, I'm sorry to cut you off. I only got two things to say. Then I gotta go. Yeah. Um. When I said earlier about the software, I think that that's like this is a really good software. And the reason I say it's because um that hearing aid feature where they take a picture, and reads to you, and it translated. That's a very useful feature because my cousins are 100% deaf. They were born deaf, and they use Android. So if they get this update, this will definitely help them in their everyday life. See things like that that can make a big impact in your life. It's something that. I think that they need to focus on, not just for Android and iOS, but for every day. Because Android is pretty much solving a problem, while Apple is kind of hinting at it, but they're not really getting there 100%. The only thing they're hitting on the ball is bugs for their software. But things like that to help people with their everyday use is something good. Because let's be honest, people that are deaf are going to use that. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm, if you look mm -hmm. at Apple, what's the one thing that they, they say that they want to do? Oh, we're going to put a little tongue with your hand emojis. Yeah, yeah, put a little yeah, tongue yeah. after. How's that helpful? It is if you really like uh, tongue detection, or I like to call it tongue detection. Ugh. It it sometimes works. So hey, uh, thanks so much for calling, Michael. Appreciate it as usual. All right. Thank you, man. And also, I'll message you on Facebook because my Twitter. I'm a little you know shook up about that. I know you wanted me to contact you, so I'll message you on Facebook. Definitely look out for me. Okay. Sounds good. We'll do. All right. Thanks, Michael. Uh, next call looks like we got is Dion calling in from the nine eight zero nine eight zero. What's up? Are you there? Yes. Calling right back. Yes, sir. What's up? What would you think about the uh, keynote? It was good. It was good. The only thing I think they should have they should have hit on mm -hmm. is we need a new Google Wi-Fi to tie everything together with the home stuff. Yeah. 
I think we you need know, a new Google One Play. I think you'll see. Quite honestly, I think if anything, you'll see something like that. Um, maybe at the at the fall event because this was really yeah, all about the developer stuff. You know, like we know, you know, sometimes they don't. They're not going to give us everything. Sometimes they just do like an announcement um, on the web. So I I think that look they have they have the distributed Wi-Fi mesh network and you know they're yeah. they're now. You know, we'll see how it all plays out. I think they have a great product, and because you know we got Eero, that's the competition with them as well. There, I don't, I don't know if I, I use an Eero at my family's house, honestly. So it doesn't. Uh-huh. I'm not like I gotta see a new Google Wi-Fi system, but you know, they should do it. <laughs> yeah, and and the next thing I like is that they're taking out some of the software updates from the OEMs and they're putting it in their own hands. Yeah. So instead of we waiting on uh, Samsung or Huawei to update our phones, Google is doing it. I think they should have done that from a long time ago. Yeah. Yeah, it's it, it was a carrier it's a carrier issue. It's it's their partnerships with the yeah. carriers. The carriers have to authorize yep. and test them out before they get in. Different carriers run at different speeds of getting yep. those software updates and that's one of the biggest issues. That's, that's why cool when they built their own phone, you get those pixel up software updates exactly when they happen, but that's just a small, small sliver of the Android audience that gets it. So, all right. Well, Hey, yep. <laughs> Dion, thank you so much for calling. Really appreciate it, bro. Yeah, man. I appreciate you too. All right. Thank you. All right. Okay. Last call, everybody. Let's go here. It looks like our friend from the nine one six, please tell us your name and where you're calling from and welcome to the show. Hey, what's going on, Brian? What's up? I'm Who's Vernon. this? This is Vernon. Vernon. What's up, Vernon? Oh, nothing too much, man. It's uh, good to get on the show. I didn't think I would actually make it. Come on, man. But, uh, Come on, I've man. I've been a fan since uh, your CNET days, man. You Thanks. and uh, Bonnie Cha, you know, putting it down. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I love her. She, she's a good friend, man. Hey, she's I a have, good friend. Right? I had a question for you, man. Um, are you going to bring back the uh, the prize fight? Man, you know what? So many, uh, yeah. so many people ask you. I'm quite honestly, I'm working on a graphics package for it because, um, yeah, I'm doing this all independently, but it just takes time to get there. And you know, I'm juggling a lot of a lot of balls to make this all happen. So, um, the short answer is yes, working on it. Long answer is my hunch is that it'll come back sometime before the end of this year. But it just takes time to get it all in place. But it's everyone is asking me to bring something like that back and. I already ha- I have it in my brain and I have someone that I'm working with so um I would just say be patient but it's not going to be anytime soon. <laughs> okay, that's <laughs> that's awesome man. Hey, I just had uh, uh two other questions. Yeah. Um how do you think the uh the 3A XL will compete with uh iPhone 11 later this year? I mean, mm. we all know iPhone is always that phone to be, you know, and you know, you look at all the the new features and stuff like that that uh, that Google is coming out with, but it's really hard to win over you know Apple users because you know a lot of us are are so connected to the ecosystem. So I mean, how do you think uh, you know 3A XL will compete with uh, you know the 11 uh, Max? And also, um, you know, how do you feel about the state of tech so far as far as uh, privacy is concerned? I mean, you know, a lot of these. Google Home devices and stuff like that, you know, they're definitely making uh, life a bit easier. But, I mean, you know, it's really inviting, you know, ears right into your your living room or or bedroom, you know, depending on where you have uh, your home devices set up. So I just – I was wondering if I could get your thoughts on that. So I think um, ultimately the Pixel 3a is going to be a mid-range phone. It's not going to – only because right now people still aren't – I would say comfortable the general population the three the pixel phone still doesn't matter to them and that's up to Google to make them care about it so if you're talking about the iPhone 11 and the Pixel 3a even though it's 399 a there's no way that I would ever expect it to be able to surpass the iPhone in sales I don't even think it would be able to take I'm going to go out on a limb and say I don't even think it would be able to take like a 5% chunk out of the iPhone. I think what Google has done and they because they have the money to invest in this and it's and it's the right thing to do if, for them to make strides, they've just got to keep on staying in the game, right? They've got to continue to evolve yeah. this product, keep on making the assistant better, the actual hardware better, 
basically they are already doing it where they have their own flagship phone, which is in their vision. And they've got to make it more available to consumers and get that story out. Because right now, only the people that really care about tech really, really know about the Pixel and would even consider it. My mom is only looking at an iPhone and she'll probably only look at an iPhone for the rest of time. And quite honestly, she would be the market based on that price point where the Pixel would make sense. So um, it's not going to make a dent anytime soon. I don't think it's a bad product. There's a lot of products that are actually really good. Um, but just because they they don't sell doesn't mean that they're they're a crappy product to me, quite honestly. It depends. There's a lot of reasons. There are some crappy products. But uh, I wouldn't expect it to make any dent anytime soon. And then if you, in response to your um, talk about privacy and the, and the current state of privacy in the tech world, obviously it's a big priority. Obviously tech companies are starting to figure out. You even saw Google today talk about how the activity of the AI and your conversations and all that stuff is going to take place specifically on your phone. It's going to be encrypted. It won't be able to be sent out anywhere else. That is, if I honestly recall the first time that they have really made it a point to say that where that used to be Apple's story to tell, now it's part of Google's story. We already know and we've seen what's happened to Facebook and what they're doing with user data, how they're delivering and targeting ads. I just can't get my head wrapped around the fact that I should ever really, truly trust Facebook still. So I'm not there yet. It's the number one right. issue in tech, <laughs> but it's not the sexiest issue in tech, right? Privacy is not a sexy issue, but it matters. I think Apple is doing it right, but also it's hurting their product. And now Google is to the point where they have the assistant, all this great stuff on your phone, and they're going to do security on device. So um, public perception, everyone's going to say Apple is the leader, but I think today Google took a big step into kind of moving that needle. It just comes down to, you know, Google is so big already that you already know you give them your email, your phone number, they know everything about you. But from a phone standpoint, I think they did a really good job today. Exactly. Yeah, I think so too. But uh, just really quickly, how how long do you think, you know, Apple can, uh, you know, lag behind the curve as far as innovation? You know, you look at uh, iOS, uh, you know, 13 that's coming out, and there's not really too much that, that we haven't seen already. You know, they're making refinements and stuff like that, but we still don't have two app uh, multitasking. You know, you have it on the iPad, you <laughs> don't have it on the iPhone. You know, how much longer do you think Apple can get by, you know, uh, on their, uh, you know, basically relying on on the Apple sheet, you know, continuing yep. to, to, to buy their products. You know, I just wonder how, how much longer that they can last, you know, without, you know, uh, implementing and introducing some of these, you know, uh, uh, for lack of a better term, Android-esque, you know, features, mm -hmm, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think that, look, 2019 is still not going to be a great year for innovation from the iPhone standpoint. Uh, everything that we've seen that is lining up, look, even if they bring this triple rear camera, I'm, first of all, I didn't, I bought the iPhone XS and I returned it because it wasn't enough for me to literally say this is worth an upgrade, you know, People that review tech and everything, yeah, they get the phones from Apple and they can get whatever phone they want. But I'm thinking about like pra like from a practical standpoint, does it really do much different that is worth it? And to me, the answer is no. Like, I think it's important to buy your own products and factor that into the equation. And so, because otherwise every product is good. Of course it is, right? So um, sure. I think 2020 is really the year where we might see the next step from a hardware innovation standpoint, but you're talking about a three-year gap where Apple really hasn't done much and the ecosystem isn't going to change. But what we've seen now across the board, whether it's Android or Apple or people are not updating their phones nearly as much. It's I think overseas is starting to look like somewhere like a two and a half to three year life cycle of people upgrading their phones. I know plenty of people wow. who are normally <laughs> a one year upgrader definitely didn't go from 10 to 10 S. Obviously if you have an earlier phone, the 10 S is a great buy, but that year to year, the days of upgrading your phone year to year to year is is becoming less and less uh, in style and it's not the fad anymore. And because the hardware is maturing and it's really hard for them to give us this great reason to do it. Triple lens camera might, but then I think about, man, the, the next phone is really going to be the next big breakthrough. So um, I'll see. I'll get the phone. I'll try it out. And if it 
if it is do enough, like a faster processor doesn't matter to me. It's now coming down to what are the software features that you can do to really take this right. to the next level. I hear that. Right? I'm right there with you. Yeah. <laughs> so there well, you hey, go, Brian, my man. Thanks for having me on. Oh man, thank yep. you. Thank you so much for calling. Was it Vern or was it Vernon? It's uh, Vernon. Vernon. All right. Got you, bro. Thank you so much for calling in. Thanks for watching and hanging, and uh, we'll see you next time, all right? All right. Appreciate it. Cool. Appreciate it, too. All right, everybody. Um, That's going to do it for the Google I.O. live stream coverage. Thanks for hanging out with me and uh, kind of dealing with some of the audio issues that I had, but I actually honestly figured out what was the problem. I had a bad splitter, and I couldn't actually hear the same mix that you were. It, I got it fixed, all right? So, anyways... Thank you so much. Um, again, the next keynote that is most likely going to be the one that we'll do is uh, Apple WWDC, which happens on June the 3rd, which is a Monday. We'll do a live stream there. Uh, I'll be posting you know, all my videos on this YouTube channel. And if you really feel like you can and you'd like to, again, I'm 100% um, independent. And let me just pull this up for you. Uh, I'm doing the hustle. I'm doing the grind. But you know, I'm, I'm fortunate. I'm loving it. This is my page. It's patreon.com slash Brian Tong. We do audio podcasts delivery to you. You get early access to content. We have exclusive content as well, starting at $2 per month. Uh, we have different levels, 5, 10, 25, 100. But, um, and also thank you to everyone in the super chat that uh, supported, man, and everyone who's just like still here hanging out. Uh, so grateful for this and so grateful to do this. And just, we're talking tech. I mean, we're lucky. We're talking tech. We're sitting at our computer talking to each other, talking about tech. Sheesh. That is... That's just a blessing right there. So, all right, everybody, thank you so much again. Um, we'll talk to you soon. Take care, be safe, and until next one, peace.